an increased way all throughout this evening. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
worship you and we open our ears to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you team. so much, worship team. Yeah, we're going to take a moment just to greet the folks around you. Just reach your hand out. Hello, my name is. And I want my five guests to come up here. We want to welcome everyone joining us online as well. We are so glad that you're with us for these special weekends in July. Okay, let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats. Go ahead and make your way back to your seats. Okay, Eric and Ken, Andy, Francis, come on up here. Chris, you five guys come up here real quick. Yeah, yeah, Eric, that's you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want you to see these five guys. And Mark Anderson, I want you to pray over them real quick. Mark Anderson is the leader of the YWAM base here, one of our dearest friends. We are so locked in with YWAM. He's an international leader. But these five guys, we're just connecting and getting to know each other. We were going to meet for a few hours yesterday, last night, and we went five hours almost, and we're going to be three hours a day, but we talked seven. So we're, we've been talking like a seven maniac. Hours. So pray for them real quick. I just wanted everybody to greet them. Let's give them one more big greeting. <laughs> pray for them, Mark, and thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of what we're doing in the days to come. So yes, go ahead. Lord, I thank you for these friends. And the Lord God, that each one is faithfully walking out the gift that you've given them. And Lord, I trust that tonight, this week, these two weeks, everything, Lord, that's on your heart, all that you have in your mind that you want us to enter into, that we'll enter in. We won't miss any aspect of it. Lord, we know this is the hour where there's great tribulation around the earth that's growing, we also know it's the hour when the sun's going to be revealed. And so, Lord, we trust that you'll help us enter into that place where we can help the revealing of the sun, Father, of your son. And uh, we love you. Trust that you will grant them the grace they need for everything that's at hand. I pray for Mike, our dear friend, my dear friend, that has just navigated so faithfully so many years what you've assigned to him that he would have the wisdom, the understanding to know how to lead and manage all this time for your glory, again, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You guys can go be seated. Yeah, yeah. Just as they're making their way back to their seats, I know that many of their family members came with them and their team members as well. We would just like to welcome you as an IHOP KC family. And if you came with them, would you please stand up just wherever you're at in the room? Family members, Anybody friends, team members. Him, yeah. Man, we are so glad that you're here with us. In a moment, we're going to receive an offering. We have uh, three meetings this week, all 6 o'clock, and three meetings next week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all at 6 o'clock. And we're going to take an offering each time because we want to cover some of the expenses of, of this uh, gathering, this special time, which I'm calling this 
fantastic title. It's called Two Weekends in July. That, that, that's the name of this gathering. Two Weekends. So powerful. It, yeah, yeah, I thought it was. But, and there's a few expenses in it. We won't pay them, but we want to give a blessing to them. They came actually at their own expense just to be together, to sit before the Lord, to talk and pray and prophesy, not to have a conference, not to have a public meeting. But somebody said, here you got the world expert on Bonhoeffer and Luther in your midst. Why don't you just interview them? I thought, you know, that. that's a good idea. So we just kind of made this kind of spontaneous. But it, they came on their own. They said, we'll pay our own way. We're coming to connect at the heart level in the Holy Spirit. And again, last night we talked almost five hours. And today, seven. Went twice as long as we were planning because it just kept on going. Awesome. It's awesome. Well, just a quick housekeeping point. If you have an empty seat next to you, you may no longer reserve it. So please, if you would, raise up your hand because we have folks at both entrances that are waiting to grab a seat. So please be bold and filled with wait, integrity. Wait, I got an idea. If raise they your don't, hand if you have a wait, seat next to you. if they don't raise it because they're giving up their friend, the guy behind pointed. <laughs> And my kids, you can't raise your hands because okay, I gotta, no. I gotta sit over there in just a second. So, <laughs> so please raise up your hand if you have a seat next to you that you're willing to and give up. It. So and then those at the entrances, please go find a hand that's raised. And there's your, your seat right there. Keep your there. hand up for about a minute. And ushers, Thank you for go ahead and come that. forward if you would. And again, we want to sew in these six nights and be a blessing to these guys and just, just to these two special weekends. Beautiful. Well, the information on how to give will be up on your screen right now. Father, we come before you as a spiritual family. Father, we love you. We honor you. We commit these evenings to you. We ask that your presence would come, that your power would come. We want to see Jesus. We want to see one another with the eyes of heaven. Father, we love you. We honor you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Okay, thank you, Helen. Okay, Eric and Francis, come on up if you would. Eric will put you in the middle. Francis? Yeah, let's grab those microphones and then I'll just move this thing out of the way. There you go. There you go. Thank you. I can't believe you guys would do ministry without a jacket. Well, I tried to get Francis to wear a jacket. He just wouldn't. You were supposed to wear green. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, we've had a ball the last 24 hours. We've really had an incredible time. A ball's not the right word. We've had a great time together. You guys, okay, I'm just going to talk because I don't know what we're doing up here. Um, okay, so my family just got here, and I'm telling them, like, you don't understand. This has been the most mind-blowing day of my life. That's a big statement. This is not an exaggeration. Like, I'm listening to stuff, and it's something about this group that has gotten together, which it wasn't supposed to be everyone. That exactly. was your doing. Um, it was supposed to be me, you, and Andy. And honestly, because I don't know these other three guys, and they even interviewed me beforehand. I'm like, it was supposed to be me, Mike, and Andy. I don't know if these other three are going to screw it up. That, that literally came out of my mouth. Um, it's on video, okay? I, I filmed it, saying it, so I have proof. I love it. <laughs> and I'm just being honest, but now I, the way the conversations, the way the Spirit has led these six people from different worlds, and we yes. are talking about mind blowing things. Yes. I'm yes. not just talking, okay, okay, I come from a non charismatic, anti charismatic world, okay? Some of you guys know that, so. This is all new to me. And so they're kind of used to some of this stuff. But for you, me, where do you come from? <laughs> you know, biblically, we should bring you to the brow of a cliff to cast you off, right? About yeah, now. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but in my. Of course, that, that's what they did to Jesus, so it's yeah, a compliment, yeah, really. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. In my former life, I. I would find myself in a lot of places where I just thought, wow, these guys are brilliant. You know, they're on another level, you know? And my old mindset was like, you know, the charismatics, they just kind of dream and have visions, but they don't know the word of God. They don't, you know, you know? I mean, that's just what I thought. And so, I, you know, that's why Mike blew my mind. You know, when I met him years ago, I'm like, wait, you know the Bible. Like, you really know the Bible. Like, I'm embarrassed by your Bible knowledge. And I started me And then this, the, this last 24 hours, I, and this is, I think we'd all agree. Yes. I'm the dumbest person in the room. Like, no, no, clearly. No, you already no, said it. No, 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 no. Too late. You prophetically said yes before I even knew what to say. So I don't want anyone hearing this thinking, oh, okay, they just told about old experiences or this vision from the Lord. I am blown away by the word of God that is rolling out of their mouths and looking at scripture. Some, you know, you guys that I have, you're used to this. Um, but then to hear these stories and the way it all came together and my heart is just leaping because it is all, there's this, this understanding of like, we are in a different time right now and we have got to wake up. We cannot be lukewarm during this time, which has been my life message. And, and it's, just, it's just melding with everything these guys are saying. And I'm trying to explain it all to my family, you know, right after lunch and all those crazy things that happen. I'm like, la, 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 la. and you guys know this is what I've been saying my whole life. And then here's a stream of people that, that I didn't know and didn't even like back then. And now it's like, what? This is the exact same thing you're preaching. And there was so much of this going, that, there's no way I can explain it to you. That's I'm, clear. <laughs> I don't know, because I was there. I don't know what you're talking about. This was an average day in our world, man. This was no big deal. <clears throat> All right. Like, we, in fact, we're disappointed that we didn't see the Shekinah glory today, because usually, <laughs> right? 
That's almost Wait, every day. That's normative, brother. Oh. I gotta say this. Those of you that don't know Eric, okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, I want to tell you, he is an amazing guy, but here's how I described him to people like a couple months ago backstage. I said, he is like, he is as funny as Isaac Bennett with a free spirit, a little funnier than that. And they said, no way. And I said, and as biblically sound as Isaac, I said, just a little funnier than Isaac when he's totally free. <laughs> and that's the funniest man I've ever met is Isaac when he's really free. But he, too. Yeah, there were a couple of times where yeah, it, was, it got crazy. But OK, okay. last thing, and then okay. you guys can No, do. no, not last okay. thing. You know, like some of you guys know my story that I, we just got back from Hong Kong. I, we we're so sad, but the visa situation didn't work out. We we're there for like a year. And, I just thought that's where I was going to be. And it's like, ah, oh, I gotta go back to the U.S. You know, like, really just thought we had our lives set. And we're so excited and so happy as a family. So it was a real downer to come back, you know, um, a couple months ago. But this changes everything. No, it's, it's that big where I'm going, no, I had to be back for this and whatever these next two weekends in July, whatever, that's a great name. Um, no, seriously, one time we Have had- Have you copyrighted that? <laughs> no, when, when I said that Sunday, I go, because people say, what are we naming it? Because we only put this on the website yesterday. Because people go, what is this? I go, no, we'll announce it after we do it because we can't fit in the building. I said, yeah. two weekends in July, and Isaac, our lead pastor, the, the guy who said it is so funny, he goes, that sounds like a Hallmark movie. That's cool. <laughs> Exa exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you had a good title, this room would be really full. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank the Lord you didn't. Anyways, I'm trying to be serious here. Okay. <laughs> Just ignore those two. So... In 24 hours already, like, I, I just, I don't even know what's gonna happen next. I don't know what, but, but I really, I don't just say these things. Like, I, I've never had a meeting like this, and I've never walked into a time like this, and man, it, we're, we're laughing, we're blown away by these stories and everything else, but I really believe there's something yes, yes. sacred yes. about this, and there's something about all these streams coming together, you know, of people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and are from some different backgrounds, but I believe God blesses that pursuit of unity that is so... Uh, you know, what, what Christ died for. And so in that, there's going to be blessing. Oh, so I kind of came in anticipating that because whenever I've sought that type of unity, I've seen God bless. Um, but today was still that mind-blowing to me. So No, I appreciate that. I really do. And so <clears throat> I'm going to give a two-minute kind of recap for those that are new to this meeting. You're going, what's kind of going on? Uh, a week ago, Friday, on June 25th, I took an hour, about, about a week ago, whatever, and gave the larger story, and it's on our website, and it's called Compassion and Worship, Prophetic and Intercession. It seems like a strange why I titled that, but I tell the story of these five guys with myself, these six guys, these six streams, and what happened on April 9th, some really important things happened on April 9th, and the, those of you that are a part of this, you know it, and those of you that aren't, you can hear the, the hour presentation, but all six of us had a role the Lord highlighted from six different streams in a unique way on that day, and the Lord highlighted Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the most, I believe, significant lives of the 20th century in the body of Christ, and highlighted Luther, and highlighted April 9, and April 18, 418, and most of you know the story, some of you don't, but these six guys, myself and the five, they were highlighted by the Lord in a way that was so unusual, I thought, I don't know how this fits. So then, about two weeks later, this is what Francis is saying, he sent an email and says, hey, I just feel like I wanna bring my family and come to Kansas City for two weeks, first two weeks in July, this is the middle of April, 
and just be in the prayer room and be with the Lord and just connect hearts and just connect with Jesus together. And I said, fantastic. And Andy is in the email and he goes, I'm coming too. So I go, oh my goodness. And that, I'm not going to say nothing to anybody. I'm just going to have these two good friends. We're going to do this. And so then a, a day or two or a week, whatever it was later, uh, Chris Reed calls up and, or we talk, we do email and calls. I go back and forth and he says, hey, I so loved being there on April 9th. Can, I want to come again. I don't need to preach. I just want to be with you. I just love you guys. But I'm not free till the first week or two of July. I said, okay. Well, I got two friends coming, but he goes, no, I'll stay out of the way. Don't worry. I'll just blah, blah, blah. I go, no, no, it's not like that. I was thinking, Chris Reed meets Francis Chan, blows his mind. I go, yeah, yeah. I go, that would be good. I just got enough of that in me. I went, yeah, without telling Chris. And then Ken Fish, who you'll know in a minute, and you'll know him well by the end of these two weekends, and who's been a part of the vineyard for many years, him and Chris are connected, and he, we could talk, and he goes, hey, next time Chris comes to Kansas City, I just want to be there, like as a spiritual father, just stand behind him. I don't need to do nothing, just to be a blessing to him. I go, well, he's coming in July. He goes, okay, I'll come in July. And I went, Okay, I got four friends coming, and they don't know each other. Okay, I mean, two of them know each other, but the other ones don't. He goes, oh, I looked at my calendar. I can't. I'm at Eric Metaxas' house in New York. I go, okay, just come in October then. I'm sure Chris will come again. And so in a day or two or three or whatever later, he goes, hey, I talked to Eric. What if he came? I mean, he's the Bonhoeffer Luther guy that showed up on April 9th. I go, really? I go, this is, this is the... Weird, not weirdest, the somethingest gathering that I never organized. <laughs> and so one or two of them said, well, what are we going to do? I go, I just talk and pray and hug and tell stories and prophesy. I don't know. And that's how this happened. And so I love it how Francis says, I came here. We just came, the two of us, and these other guys showed up. What's going on here? But it's just the Lord, isn't it? We couldn't have put this together and, and I got so many good friends around the nation, and they said, why didn't you mention? I said, M I put a fleece before the Lord in April. I said, whoever says I'm coming in the first week of July with no knowledge of anything, they're in the conversation with us. So I'm throwing it out, and if this strange guy from Yugoslavia calls, I said, come, July, come on in, sit in the circle, because they don't know each other anyway. Let's just see what happens. And nobody else did. It was just the same six guys that was highlighted on April 9th. And it, it all happened without any organization. So that's enough of all that. We're going to shift gears now. So Lord, we just ask you tonight, tomorrow, the next night, Saturday, this next week, the next weekend, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your leadership. We say that we don't know how to go forward. We don't know what to do. You are the steward. You are the escort. And we thank you. And we ask you, even tonight, as we talk about this most significant life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and then we have ministry time afterwards, extended ministry time with Ken Fish and Chris Reed, we just ask you to touch us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, the reason I'm really, I've been touched by Bonhoeffer and Luther in a unique way for many years without knowing that God pushed him to write these two biographies and they became bestsellers and he gave years to their life and, but they were really important to me for years without knowing how important they were to him and so this has came together. And the real reason, there's things in their life you might not like or disagree with, or that's not the real point. The courage they had, the courage they had to stand up against opposition at the threat of their life. Both of those two men, 400 years apart from each other, they, 400 years plus, they took a stand that was sure, surely they would lose their life, but they did it for Jesus and the word of God, and Bonhoeffer lost his life, and by a miracle, Luther did not, because the stand he took, he was sure to die right away, and he knew it. And these two lives, I, the picture of courage and who they are, that's the message that, that we have here. Another point or two is that as a, 
team and as a, a, a whatever family, an assign, whatever we are, we have a divine a, a movement, etc. We have a divine assignment from the Lord from 80, 38 years ago when I first met Bob Jones, the Lord made it so clear to stand with Israel related to the coming of the Lord even when Israel's persecuted, even unto death. It was that kind of dramatic. That's how I got connected to Bonhoeffer and Luther was through that lens 38 years ago because he goes, God has called this. He says, well, the very first day I met Bob Jones, he goes, you're gonna have 24-hour prayer and worship, et cetera, et cetera, and you're gonna stand for Israel. And I don't bear witness or whatever you call it. I don't like any of it. And he goes, and the Lord's gonna cause you millions of you around the world to stand for Israel, and it will even be at the loss of people's lives, on and on and on. And so I've carried this in our heart, and our, and our team and our world and our family knows this a little bit. So that's a little bit of what we're talking about. And so you wrote the Bonhoeffer biography, sells a million copies. I mean, the thing is 600 pages. What book, 600 pages, sells a million copies? So... What? Why did you do this? I mean, no well, book that thick sells a million copies. Well, I took his, you know, uneventful life and just used the magic of my gift of writing, um, you know, to really make something out of it. That's amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's about it. No, it's... <laughs> well, we talked today about this. I mean, the, I, I don't really have the time probably to go into it now, but the writing of it... I never wanted to write a biography ever. I always joke around, I'm way too self-centered to spend that much time thinking about some other person, right? <laughs> and if you had said to me at any time in my life, do you ever think you'll write a biography? Because I, I want to be a writer. I would have said, I can guarantee you pretty much I will never write a biography. Because you've written 30 children's books. Well, and I mean, I, I also books. never wanted to write a children's book. But you've written 30 So of the them. Lord's ways are not our ways. Uh, and he and was I'm not even kidding. In writing Veggie Tales. Yeah, this is the Veggie Tale guy. Some of it. He yeah. was the voice for Esther. Or how were, were you, Esther? I can't take. I can't take a lot of credit, and I and I mean I had the privilege of working for them. I I, I wrote half of Lila Kindly Viking. I wrote the Hamlet Omelet parody. And who were you, Bob? And then the, the, and then the and then no. Uh, <laughs> by the, by the way, you know we got to get serious for a second. Okay. Pray for Bob, because he's. Uh, He's a bitter, you know, on the camera, he's like a happy Christian tomato. But behind the scenes, he's, a, he's like a bitter, chain-smoking agnostic. And, you know, I don't normally share that publicly, but he's messed up. So I had the privilege of working for, for VeggieTales and the fact that, don't let the children hear that. I, I, for VeggieTales, but I didn't get to do much for them, but I, I, I was the voice of the narrator on the Esther video. Oh. So if you listen to the... I want to bottle whatever that sound was, because I need that as encouragement. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm the, so if you listen to the Esther video, I'm the voice in there. So I didn't do much for them, but, I, but I, I got to do some stuff for them, wrote some books. But the Lord has just given me a bizarre career, you know, and uh, I knew I always wanted to be a writer. I wanted him to use me since I got saved in 88, but I never thought I'd write a biography. And uh, one day uh, somebody, it's a kind of crazy story, but I say this, a lot of times Christians say this kind of falsely, humble stuff, and I'm being honest when I say I never want to write a biography, and the Lord just maneuvered me into writing but this intensely story. intentionally maneuvered you intensely. Oh, clearly, clearly, on, on, on purpose, wanted me to write the biography of William Wilberforce, oh. which is a book called Amazing Grace. And we thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just make sure you buy a copy, okay? Because uh, we live in New York, it's not easy. So, <laughs> but I mean, so I wrote the, that, and I never thought I'd write a, I never thought I'd write a, uh, a biography. And after I wrote the story of Wilberforce, who, who, because of his Christian faith, led the battle against the slave trade in the British Empire, right? You're all against the slave trade? Right on. Okay, so I thought if ever I were to write another biography, maybe, maybe, I guess it would have to be about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Because here's a guy who, because of his Christian faith, stood up against the Nazis, spoke out for the Jews, whatever. And you know, I'm always trying to build bridges, and I think any pagan knows slavery and racism is wrong, and they all know killing the Jews is wrong. So if you say, oh, and by the way, the person who led that was led because of his faith in Jesus Christ, like that's just a powerful witness. It's to make people go, oh, interesting, right? So that's really why I wanted to write 
those two books and why I wrote, bon why I said I might write Bonhoeffer and there's more to it, but I never dreamt that what I was getting into and as I shared this afternoon, it was a very painful process. Three it was, years. It was, well, it was just, I mean, more than just the time. It was just an agony. I had to switch publishers. It was deeply unpleasant. But the Lord spoke to me in a dream. Do you guys believe in that here? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and, uh, and in the dream, the Lord just kind of made it clear. It's a long story, but it was a true miracle miracle, which I shared this afternoon. And the Lord made it clear to me that he had his hand on this book. And I needed, as, as the process of writing it went along, which was so painful, I had to, you know, I, I was clinging to that. Just saying like, okay, but the Lord said he's, his hand is on this book. But I never dreamt that it would be successful. And I'm not kidding. I, I, I just didn't think it would be. And so all of that, the whole thing, I can say with real honesty, it had nothing to do with me. I just did what I did. And the Lord has, in retrospect, shown me the significance of why he called me to write this book and how he wants to use it to speak to the church today. Because it's a prophetic book for what's coming across the earth. It has a global message. I mean, you are a prophetic messenger. You're a faithful witness in this book. I mean, there's about 50 Bonhoeffer books or more. Most of them have sold just a few because they're, it's hard. I mean, they just have been. And But the Lord to have a million, it's because he want my prayer, not for the sake of it. I want 10 million people to have this book because I want this to go all over the world. It's in 20 languages right now. But in the next 10 years, Lord, release 20 million even copies, 10 or 20, because we need the body of Christ in the earth to be inspired by this courageous, I mean, against all odds, standing for the Lord, because what happened in Nazi Germany in the intensity is actually going to be repeated on a global level as an attack against the Jews, and, the, and more than that, in the body of Christ, the Lord is preparing the end time church to take a stand at such a time as this because so many in Germany, even the pastors and the leaders, they caved in, they got silent and they backed away. And yet there's this young man, he was 27 years old when he first took a public stand against uh, Adolf Hitler, 27 years old. And all the old guys are going, hey, bro, you know, be, you're being a little intense. Maybe Hitler's on our side because Hitler had all these Christian phrases that he gave him on the front end, and you get all that in the book. But Bonhoeffer was a step ahead of everybody. He goes, no, this is not right. And he took a stand, and it cost him his life because taking a stand like that, as you said in one of your videos, it will always cost your life. And, and, and I'm and, uh, just saying on the front end of this that just even as we're talking, I'm wanting to steer this conversation in a tailor-made way for our divine mandate, because others are joining us for around. There's a hundred ways to approach that 600-page book. There's so many phenomenal stories, interesting stories, but I want to approach it in the unique focus of having courage to stand even unto death and embracing martyrdom if it comes to that, because tens of millions of believers will need to have grace for that, and they actually will, and I believe the Bonhoeffer book is going to have a unique place in the body of Christ, in the earth, in the next 10 or 20 years. So, Lord, I'm asking you to take that book that sold a million. I asked for 10 million all over Asia. Lord, I asked for 20 million, and it would go everywhere that it would stir up a young generation in the name of Jesus. You know, one of your friends, uh, Greg Thornberry, you talked about it. I saw it in one of your videos. And by the way, he has a daily program, that uh, a radio and it's video, and you could just say a sentence or two about that. And I watch him regularly. He's got many, many, it's videoed and it's audio. You can do it any way you want. And so many important issues that he's highlighting. So I've heard so much of your story and your stuff, and I love it but I die laughing all the way through it, and then I take notes, and every now and then I cry. But anyway, it's really moving, and, and it's beautiful. But you mentioned this, that this guy, your friend Greg said that Bonhoeffer was a church father for the postmodern era, and that he was a voice to the young generation. Just comment on that for a minute. Um, gosh, there's so much to say. I guess the, the story of Bonhoeffer, I mean, I should say this, 
When I went to write it. Oh, wait, I forgot. Give 10 seconds about your, how the they radio. Can, yes, because okay. I want them to I will ask stuff. everybody, I, I, I ask this really honestly. We were just, the whole, the radio show that I do, um, we film it beautifully uh, thanks to TBN, and we, we, I, I was putting it all on YouTube. Um, I interview all kinds of people. I call it the show about everything, because one day you'll tune in, and I'll be talking to somebody like you or you or John Piper or and whoever. The next day, I'll be talking to a comedian or somebody who wrote a book on history, or I'll be talking to somebody about the election or the fake election. I can't talk about that, can I? Um, yeah. But the point is that I talk about everything. It's not a political thing. It's not a faith thing. It's about everything. And I honestly have had some of the most amazing guests. Now, the point is... YouTube, where we posted all this stuff the other day, completely... Like a week ago, though, two weeks uh, ago. Yeah, about two, two and a half weeks ago, they completely uh, canceled the entire channel forever. Because he has hundreds, I had 220,000 subscribers. They crushed it. They wiped it out. No money. I mean, we, you know, it was a part of the income. It was part of that. They destroyed it. Why? Because... Their community standards, remember Stalin also had community standards, and it's important to respect those kind of community standards. And they tell us that even talking about the vaccine or vaccine passports, out of bounds. You can't talk about that. Talking about the election and about, you can't even talk about that. Now, the point is, in America, and this does get to Bonhoeffer, the idea that in this country you're going to dare to tell anybody what they can or can't talk about, that, that is the devil. This nation is founded on freedom, and we have had a nation that for many generations has said, I could totally disagree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say what you think. That's America. So the idea that, that big tech has come in like this so they, they wiped us out of YouTube because I, I dared to interview people who talked about this stuff. This is an astonishing thing. You gotta understand, when people go, uh, no, no. That doesn't give somebody kills your kid and you go, hey, what are you gonna do, I got another one, you know? Like, is that your attitude? You're talking about freedom. People died for this freedom. And, and this freedom that we have is for the whole world. It's not for us. It's for us to be a light to the whole world. And anyway, the point is that because of that, I wanna say, uh, to anybody, please, because you can't get our stuff on YouTube anymore, please go to my website, it's just my name, ericmetaxas.com, and sign up for the newsletter. And once or twice a week, we will send you all of these videos uh, of me interviewing people, and I'm not gonna get into it, but trust me, some amazing conversations. But because it's not on YouTube, you have to go to ericmetaxas.com, sign up for the thing. Are they reverse that, you think? What's the, that? The YouTube? No, I don't think really they will. Not. I don't okay, think they I will. They would. And they and, and But, but uh, th these interviews, I really believe God has just called me to talk to all different kinds of people, right? People who believe in the Holy Spirit and Francis. <laughs> you know, different kinds of people. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on our team now. No, I, I joke. He knows I joke. But the point is that I will, I'll talk to all different kinds of people and not just believers and not just, but I mean, that to me is the joy is to, to be talking to an NT writer, whoever it is, and then the next day to have on Ken Fish to blow people's minds, just on to make them go, what? And moving in the yeah, and another, the but I like to really mix it up and I just feel like this is what God has given me to do. But the, but the, the radio program, the TV radio program, I always try to talk about what other people aren't talking about. And so sometimes it's this kind of stuff and, and whatever. So that was, was that 10 seconds yet? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That, I didn't mean to go on so much, but it's like, it, there's so much wrapped up in it. And the censorship, you could tell it gets me angry because it's really, it is really evil because this country has been free. And the idea that these, that these tech giants are making these arbitrary community standards um, it is really wicked. We've got to be very, very clear. This is, this is wicked. If you want that, you know, you can move to China right now. They have that. But in America, we should do everything humanly possible to stand against that because it is wicked and it harms us a little bit, but it is harming people around the world. If I was in a place like China, it's going to affect them. It, we have been appointed by God to hold the torch of freedom high, not for us, 
but, but for those who don't yet have it, so yeah. Okay, so 100 years ago, it's 1923. There's two young men, Bonhoeffer, he's made a decision, 1923, He's going to be a theologian. He's going to devote himself to the Word of God the rest of his, of his life. The same year, another young radical named Adolf Hitler, he takes a stand against the state, and these two guys start a trajectory that collides later, but almost nobody knew what was happening when these two men, very opposite, stood, and Hitler rose at first slowly, and the body of Christ in Germany thought he was on their team because he said all these Christian phrases. And so there's these two realities that are emerging and the most cultured nation in the earth, I mean, they put a few others up there with them, they are seduced. I mean, the word of God is through all the public school systems. I mean, everywhere the word of God is. And yet in a short amount of time, they've been duped and tricked and seduced and to agree with darkness, and Hitler looks like he's on their team for quite a while, then he pulls his mask off, finds out he's not, and I believe that at such a time as this, God is putting his hand on young Bonhoeffers right now. They're yeah. determining, I'm gonna go deep, I'm gonna go fully on with God, I don't care what it costs right. me, but there's other guys on the other side of the earth, and there's two realities emerging, and that's why I think your friend Greg said, he would be like a, a father to the postmodern era. So just, I come and I interrupted you on that when you were starting. Well, there's something about Bonhoeffer. I mean, you have to be clear. He was uh, intellectually super genius. I mean, he was just a theological genius. But what's interesting is he wasn't, you know, usually you meet somebody that's a theological genius, but if you ask him to teach a Sunday school class, they wouldn't be able to pull that off. Bonhoeffer was able to speak on the highest theological level, but he was also able to preach powerful sermons to the average man and woman in the pew. He was able to teach the faith to young people. Uh, and, and so he had, you know, this is what the Lord wants for all of us, right? He doesn't want us to have a head knowledge. He wants us to live it out. And Bonhoeffer illustrates what is it to know all this stuff and then to actually live it out when people are telling, you can't do that, don't do that, shut up. Romans 13, you can't speak up against the, the you can't do that. Can't, and he was like, well, yes, I can and I must. And I, I don't care where it leads me because I'm not afraid of death because, oh yeah, in case he didn't know, Jesus defeated death on the cross. Did you read that? Yeah, that's true. That's not a metaphor. You know, like, if you really believe that, you're gonna live differently. And so he did. And so he was inspiring, he was brilliant, he was amazing in, in so many ways. But I do wanna say that, you know, when we talk about the prophetic, when I was writing the book, I just wanted to write the biography of Bonhoeffer. There was an amazing story. But as I was writing it, I could sort of smell this prophetic, like I thought, this is happening now in America on some level. And I don't wanna believe that, but I, I could feel it, I could see it. Because whenever people say, how did that happen in Germany? How did that happen? Well, I'll say, I'll tell you how it happened. It happened exactly as it's happening now. Like a lot of good people just chose to look the other way, to say nothing, to do what they're told. That's all it takes for you to follow the devil into hell. It's really scary, and it should be scary, that God requires of us to speak the truth, to live out our faith, but Germans were very willing to just be quiet for another day or two. Don't speak up, don't speak up. Or if somebody says, you need to say Heil Hitler, you just, you just say it. Why? Because, well, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want the neighbors to look at me funny. It, you know, you don't get the choice, like, do you want to serve the devil? Yes or no? People be like, oh, uh, no. No, you don't get that. You get really small choices. And I've seen this happen in this country. And now whenever I'm talking about America, obviously, we're the bellwether nation in the world. The Lord has blessed us to be a blessing. We're not blessed for us. We're blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the world, to show them what a robust nation with freedom and Christianity and what, what that can look like and how wonderful it is. And don't you want it? It's the shining city on a hill that people will look and say, what is that? That's beautiful. I want that. And that's what John Winthrop said, quoting Jesus, you know, when he said it in 1630. That's been our history that we're like the nation for others. That's God's plan for the country. So what happens when that nation 
begins making these little compromises and, and, and saying like, well, we don't want to stand up now. I don't want to lose my job now. At what point do you keep your mouth shut and then people say, oh, by the way, so you're going to speak up tomorrow, right? Well, guess what? It's over. You can't speak up tomorrow. The window is shut. Bonhoeffer was the voice to Germany trying to say to the church, you need to be the church now. You need to speak up now. If you don't speak up against this now, this window is closing. And just like all the prophets, in their day, they were stoned or sawn in half or ignored or whatever. And then years later, we go, man, what a great guy. Isaiah was awesome. Jeremiah was they were awesome. But in their day, the people of God did not heed their prophetic voice and just said, yeah, he's a hothead. He's a hothead. Just leave it alone. It'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And then suddenly it's over. And so I really believe in retrospect that in the, in the short term, the Lord called me to write this book as a warning to the church today to say, you will definitely go down this path unless you don't do what they did. The German church did not heed the voice of the Lord through Bonhoeffer. And again, through Bonhoeffer, whether it's through my book or whatever, we're hearing the story, we see the story. And so the question is, are you gonna, you gonna get it? Are you gonna do it? Now, the end time version of it is, yeah, and that's is a little further, o- is further I, on. I but think I think it has all those levels. Yes, end time, yes, yes. Evil in the earth, Amen. Yes. 200 nations, that's where my heart has really yes. been grabbed yes. by the Bonhoeffer story. And I mean, that's a little new to me, but it's not really new to me because we talked about you, that for hours. You, you, today, you, yeah. Yeah. But it's so interesting to me that because we always know this whenever the Lord speaks, it's always happening on several levels, you know. And so Bonhoeffer, when he was doing this, he didn't think that this would have an application in the future. And he just was living his life. But today, many people have said to me that his story has inspired them to that kind of faith. And I keep saying, if you don't have that kind of faith, you don't really have any faith. I don't know, you know, I hope you get to heaven, but that's not God's plan for you just to go to heaven. There's more. Two events in Bonhoeffer's life. And Francis, I want you to comment on this together with Eric. He's 18 years old. He goes to Rome when he's 18 years old. He's already in college. He gets his PhD at 21 years old, his PhD in theology, because he just aces all this stuff. But anyway, he's 18, he goes to Rome. I mean, he's a Protestant, he's a Lutheran, and he sees, you know, 80,000 people, I don't know the real number, but in St. Peter's Square, of all these different races, this multinational church, and what he was used to is the nation of Germany all being Lutherans with the same traditional idea. They all look the same, they talk the same, And he went there and he said, I saw this multinational, multi-ethnic gathering of 60, 80,000 people. And I said, from that visual, what is the church? In Germany, we missed it. Then, when he was 24, that's when he was 18, six years later, he goes to New York City at Abyssinian uh, Baptist Church. The largest church in America was an African-American church in Harlem, 10,000 members. And he sees... This vibrant spirituality of a people in 19, uh, this would be 1930, that are being oppressed by the whites, but they're loving Jesus, singing, and he goes there to, to New York. He joins this church for nearly a year, teaches Sunday school there. I got all this from your book. And so uh, it was great, great I stuff. think you remember it a little better than I do, frankly. Oh, and he teaches Sunday school, is deeply involved in this because he's never seen an oppressed people like this, but they love Jesus. And they said a suffering people who touch the God of heaven in a different way, because Germany didn't have that in 1930. It was a little, it was a few years later before that very reality hit him in Germany when he went back home. So he began to see the multinational reality of the body of Christ. It's bigger than white Lutherans. And he saw suffering people rejoicing in Jesus. And he went back home and says, I'm going to preach that gospel. So, Right. Yeah. And I want to say, too, like, uh, your book, um, I haven't read yet. (laughs) I I was, I I know, that's why I'm kind of sitting here silently. But I want to say to you all that I have good news for people like me. A movie's coming out. 
so I'm yeah. here to promote. Yeah, the for movie. people who are non-readers, I will watch no, that. For real, they're yeah. making. He's he's yeah. uh, behind this project. They have raised ten million dollars. They want another five or ten to make a really first-class movie on his life. Oh yeah. So no, me it, and my friends can join yeah, in the conversation. Yeah, and there's going to be coloring no, books and no, all kinds of stuff. Did, hey, wait, Andy Bird, you read the whole read, thing. Six hundred pages. All of you guys at the all table have friend. read every book. Okay. Oh, okay. But I, I will say, I tried, and I, I've never read outside of the Bible. I've never read a six hundred page book. Um, well, if you feel any better, I've never even glanced at Crazy Love. Well, <laughs> no, I, at least I, I, okay, I did, I have two copies of Bonhoeffer. One was given to me and I started it and then I lost it. So then I got convicted and I bought another one. He bought it. And then I lost it. I don't care if you read it, as long I as you bought a copy, it. that's all I, I know, care about. I, I know, okay, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and Crazy Love sold three million, by the way. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> okay, sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 it no, was, stop, stop, stop. It was about 110 some. pages, though, right? <laughs> I know, and they were 110 pages, and, big font, I know, okay, big okay, font. Okay, 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 okay. Gosh, you guys, okay, so just encourage. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, again, I just don't like to read. And my staff just sees me like, you've literally written more books than you've read. And, uh, but I, I'm very convicted as a talk. I know the story like, of I don't want Bonhoeffer. the children to hear, I don't like to read. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, children, don't. don't listen to that. <laughs> listen, no, listen to this though, okay? Um, as I'm listening to these guys and the commitment of what Mike has been teaching here about the end times, the amount of study. The 150 chapters, we talked about that for quite a while today. Yeah, and listening to the story of him writing Bonhoeffer and Luther and, you know, everything else and the heartache. I was extremely convicted about uh, discipline in my life recently. And so in my mind, I am going to buy another copy unless you have a free one for me. I... I I really am. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, I preach about this and everything. I need to get through this because it's this big. And uh, my point, what I was going to get to, um, I forgot. Wait, no, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, I talked about Rome and the multinational church and then Abyssinian Baptists in New York. And Bonhoeffer saw this, his only paradigm was white Lutherans all believing the same thing, nobody stepping outside well, the box, and it wrecked his life, and that's what, that's what got him ready to be a reformer. Yeah, there were, there were just two points related to this, right? Bonhoeffer, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? We know that there's this religiosity. If you are in a certain denomination, you kind of think like that is the faith, right? But he was very sophisticated, he'd seen a lot, whatever, and then at age 18 he goes to Rome, he sees what he calls the church universal. All of these people, he wasn't such a hidebound Lutheran that he thinks the Catholics uh, are, are not Christians. So he was not, for example, like John MacArthur, for example. Can I joke about that? Um, I don't know, they're like, they're like, can we laugh? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but because he went to John MacArthur school, yeah. that's what he's talking no, no, no. about. No, 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 look, look, look. Because look. they talked about that we today. We tease around. But the point is that Bonhoeffer was open-minded enough to go to Rome and to see all these different races at, I think it was St. John's Lateran in Rome, and thinking, wow, look at, that's the church. Every race and, and you know, he, it really moved him that the church is not just German Lutherans. But then when he goes to New York, he sees... But he goes to all the white Protestant churches in New York. And let's be honest, the mainline Protestant churches, even in 1930, were dead. Already in 1930, they would just get dressed up and go to church. And the, 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 the social gospel was already being pushed. He knew there's nothing there. He could see it. He was disgusted by it. So he goes to an African-American church in Harlem, and he sees because people have suffered and been oppressed, their faith is real, and it's manifested not just in th good theology, but they lived out their faith. They fed the poor, and they did this, and they did that, and they would put out a flag anytime somebody was lynched in the South. I mean, they, their faith was in every aspect. Remember, it's 1930. 1930. With incredible racism still happening. So, 
so their faith was, was full blown. And he realized that's what we're missing in Germany. We are playing church. We go to church, we're Lutherans. Lutherans, uh, oh, you know, Luther invented Christianity, so we're, uh, we're justified by grace and we don't have to do anything. And he said, no, that's cheap grace, which he writes about in his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship. And he says, we need to live out our faith in every way, having no clue that when he goes back to Germany in 1931, he's gonna bump up against the Nazis and that they are going to bring this whole reality completely to the fore so that either you are going to stand in your faith and oppose them and their satanic doctrines, or you're gonna go with the flow and be quiet and you're gonna to contribute to the greatest evil of, of your time. So it's, it's, it's just an amazing thing. He didn't, he didn't see any of this, but the Lord prepared him by sending him to the black church in Harlem to see people really worshiping and loving Jesus and living out their faith 24 seven. And then he goes back to Germany, he goes, okay, now what about us? Because see, this is 1931 because Hitler's not in power until 1933. So he comes back at age 25 and, he, and he's in the ministry, and so Hitler's rising, but he's not in power for two more years. And then when Hitler's in power, he is seducing and flattering the church. He is making these statements like, you know, the, the strength of Germany is the Holy Spirit and our loyalty to Jesus and the Word of God. 18,000 Lutheran pastors, they are applauding him. They have swastikas all over everywhere. They're saying, this guy is restoring the church. And Bonhoeffer started speaking out against him. They came against the few that spoke out. And out of 18,000 pastors, they started this new thing, the Confessing Church. But only 3,000 of the 18,000 pastors stood for the Confessing Church. And the word Confessing Church, what they meant is we're going to confess the reality of Jesus no matter what it cost us. So 3,000 said yes. 15,000 were silent, and they took the, uh, the uh, fewer pledge, the uh, allegiance to Hitler, because they said, wait, he said he's going to bring Jesus to the nation. Let's believe him. Bonhoeffer said, no way. But here's the troubling thing. Out of the 3,000 who said yes to the uh, confessing church, only a small number stayed with it because as Hitler became more overtly evil, those 3,000 became silent and a very small number of people stood to the end, and he stood to the end. And he said, uh, I, I love this phrase that he says, he goes, Jesus has transformed death. And our understanding of death, we're not afraid of death. And he's in his 30s only, he gets killed at age 39. And he stands, but a very small number stood to the end. So how is it possible that this, this nation where 60 million of them are in Lutheran catechism, and I'm not picking on Lutherans, but they're learning the Bible all through public school, all through university. Everybody's being baptized, going through catechism, getting confirmed. 60 million of them, 18,000 pastors, 3,000 stand up, but at the end of the day, most of them back up and they're quiet and they let a few of them go to death. How does this happen? I mean, to me, that's easy. They just didn't experience persecution and they assumed like we do, I can just be a wonderful Christian and I'll never actually have to give my life like a martyr in the Middle East or I'll never, I'll just, it, it just becomes a non-issue and you're not trained to live that way. And so that's why when you think of people who are, uh, you know, even in this country, if, if you're reading the stories of the martyrs and you, are, you have a heart for missions, and you're in touch with people that are being persecuted now, whatever, it changes your faith. They didn't have that faith, and obviously most of us in America haven't had that kind of a faith. And so when it comes, you're really not prepared. Um, and Because they assume business as usual is okay. Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm also seeing something where, like I'm listening to you guys talk, and I'm going, gosh, I see that in my life in my lifetime, and it's happening to me, where it's, it's not, oh, Francis, go follow the devil now. No, um, but it's, it's, there's been this, this, this flow of certain topics you don't talk about anymore. And, and because you'll reach a greater number of people if you avoid those topics, 
and and then there is the the uh, the cancel culture. There is you know this this the social media thing where you say one thing wrong and or not even wrong. You, you just say one thing that people don't like. You and just said vaccination or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, um, so you, you start, I noticed myself, I, I caught myself many times where, wait, I used to speak about this a lot more directly and, and now I'm being more cautious. I wouldn't deny it, but I don't speak up. So you see how you slowly, slowly don't talk about certain things. And, I, and I've been catching myself recently. I go, man, when's the last time I preached about hell? Then I, man, in high school, man, when I became a believer, like I'm talking to my friends and I'm, I'm just like, man, I'm terrified about this. I'm scared about this for you. I'm throwing it out there. But slowly, you know, the church starts going, well, you know, let's not preach a fire and brimstone. And, you know, there's a, there's a possibility that no one goes there. There's a possibility it means this, 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 this. I'm like, no, 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 no. But then you just slowly, I don't know what happens. Like you make little compromises. And, and this scares me. I, it, it scares me. Like, I remember uh, when iPhones came out and we had this gal living with us and, and she got one and, you know, we were playing some game and she kept checking her phone and we're like, you know what? If you don't put that thing away, you're not a part of our family anymore. Like, we're sick. You're like, oh, I hate it. I hate it. But what happens? Pretty soon all of us are doing that. Because I hated that she was distracted and couldn't look us in the eye. Like these things just start happening. And, and, and then I'm looking at my kids. You know, my oldest kid is 25. I've got two grandkids. But my youngest is six. You know, and I've got teenagers still. And I've got, you know, and I'm looking at the way they're growing up. And these last two weeks, man, it was like a ditch effort to save the minds of my kids. I'm like, hey, we're going out to Alaska and there's no screens. You're not gonna bring your phone where you're not gonna look at one thing. We're just gonna talk. I want you to connect with me, with our family, with people, humans, you know, fish, birds, you know, whatever. You know, I, I want you to be clear-minded, you know, because First Peter 4, 7 says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. You guys, you, you, you can't even pray anymore. Like, like your mind, when you close your eyes, you have a trillion thoughts running through because you're just attached to this entertainment. So all these things are flowing, flowing, flowing. And so what you're saying about Nazi Germany is, is it's like, it, it, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's all of these things sweeping and I think that's what I've enjoyed about our times. It's, it's like this stand where together we're going, no, we can't go there. We can't. And, and, and sometimes by yourself in isolation, it, you just can't do it. You know, you drift. And that's why I thank God for this time because it, it helped me go, oh, shoot. I've been on this island and I, I need to get back and no, together, let's, let's not drift from this. Let's, let's, let's do something. We can't go, we can't go there. See, you got to understand, I love this. This is so right because we need each other in this. But when you go back to Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, the death camps were three years. Hitler was in power 12. And we all interpret Hitler today through those three years. We don't know about the nine years leading up where he was seducing the nation to be, I mean, they were celebrating him the first three, four, five years. Almost everybody was. And then as it got closer, more and more got silent. They were not celebrating, but they wouldn't speak up. It was only the last three years. And so much of these details are in your book. But the one thing I love about his book uh, is that it, people get captured by the Bonhoeffer story so they get hooked on the book, and it's really a great read. I mean, it's a page turner, it really is. And you're gonna really wanna stay with it, but he gives all these details of what's happening in the government through those 12 years, and the people are going, wait a second, we can see some of those things. Yes, America, but I'm talking about the earth. Because I don't believe, I don't have an idea that Adolf Hitler is gonna rise in America, but he's gonna rise on the global scene, 
and many in America will be supporting him, like the, and leaders in America will. That's going to be our problem. They're going to get seduced by it because they're moving in that direction right now. So I don't think Adolf Hitler is going to be America. That's not my point of view. But there's going to be an Adolf Hitler far more powerful in the global scene and a global unity. But remember, he was only the death camps for three years, not the first nine. And that's the part that we might lose our way on thinking we're going to be okay. And they got sucked into it little by little. And that's what's really serious. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say that one thing, this has come to me fairly lately, right? But it, just in the last few years, roughly since you know Trump was elected, you're told you can't talk about that. Or if you're on that side, you're canceled or you're out or whatever. That's only a year or two that you can't talk or yeah. you're out of well, the game. Well, yes. But what I'm saying is I felt it, you know, since his, his election that people were more radical in canceling you and saying, like, you can't think that. You can't, you can't. You know, it was, it began, but yes, in the last year and a half, it's become more serious. But most, so, so I say that because it struck me that if you are not, practicing speaking the truth and not doing what you're told or doing what you're told you can't do. If, you, if you're not doing that on a daily level, if you just kind of go with the flow, it becomes harder and harder to stop and speak the truth. The other day, um, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was on Twitter, I guess, and I followed the New York Mets since I was a little kid, right? And I said the you New grew York. Up in New York. What's, I, yeah, I grew up in, in a, a mile from Shea Stadium, and I, I see the New York Mets tweet, and the New York Mets logo is in rainbow colors for the month of June. And I thought, you've got to be kidding! You're kidding! This is a baseball team, but they feel this corporate pressure to celebrate Pride Month, right? Now I'm offended because it's one thing if you say. This is a free country, and if you believe differently than me, you can live your life. We're a free country, right? We let people do things that we don't have to agree with them. But now you're telling me that everybody in America needs to celebrate for a month gay pride. And I'm thinking, no, there's something really sick about that. Because most, most, all serious Jews, serious Muslims, serious Christians can't celebrate that. Now we can say, I love you no matter what, and I can have friends that are, you know, they can be single people sleeping with their, with their girlfriends, or I can have friends that are this or that. Or whatever. It, it, I have, the Lord wants me to love everybody. But don't tell me now for a month, because everybody, somebody decided, I need to jump in and celebrate this, otherwise something's wrong with me. That is what happened in Germany. In Germany, when the Nazis came in, but the point is, the pressure is so strong, and the reason I've become increasingly outspoken lately is because I want people to know we've all got to take a stand. We will do it in love, of course, but we're being pushed around, folks. When somebody starts telling you, like, every website's gonna be rainbow colors for the month of you think, wait a second, we, we, we don't give fathers a month. We give them a day, barely. We don't give mothers a month, we give it to veterans. I mean, what, what, is, what is happening that, that, that just happened? Somebody decided that, and it is, a, it is a real push against anybody who has a biblical view of sexuality, not just Christians, anybody, but the idea that you're gonna celebrate this now for a month, and if you don't, something's wrong with you. You're kind of bigoted, I don't know about you. That's exactly what happened in Germany when the, when the Nazis took power. If you did not vigorously say, Heil Hitler, and I've got a swastika outside of my door, they looked at you like, something's wrong with you, huh? You wanna keep your job? They, you wanna keep your job? I don't know about you. And, and if ever you're gonna talk about the rise of a false world religion, that's what this is. Yeah. This is not about gays. This is about a false world religion that is antichrist. And I thought to myself, so if we don't speak up against that now, and I'm not telling you how to speak up, but I'm telling you that when I saw that, I thought, whoa, that's not okay. That's not okay. And there are many things like that, that if you are not actively against it in some way, 
I mean, we, we said it before, you know, if, if you think the election was fraudulent, okay? Now, I, I'm convinced of it, but you don't have to agree with me, but if you're gonna tell me I can't talk about it, I'm gonna be like, what? Like, I'm not in China, I'm in America. I can talk about anything I want, and if you tell me I can't talk about it, I think that's a message that I need to, to, sh to shout about it, because we cannot survive in a culture where somebody whether it's big tech or whoever it is, they're making some decisions and we as citizens cannot abide by that. And it doesn't even, it doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. We need to stand with people with whom we disagree, okay? In other words, if, 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 if somebody says to me that, uh, I mean, if, if I have a friend who's convinced the election was on the up and up, in this day and age, I hope that that friend will stand for the people who don't see it that way, not because, just because, but because somebody has decided that you can't say that. And that to me is a chilling thing, it's anti-American, and again, this is not about America, but the point is this is a deeply biblical value that we have been outrageously blessed to have. And so when you think, how did that happen in Germany? That's what I say, it's when people just say like, well, I don't wanna talk about that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that, I'm not gonna preach about hell, I'm not gonna preach about biblical sexuality because because what? Because you're mean? Because you're nasty? Because you don't know what the scripture says? In other words, we are being very slowly and cleverly shut down. And, and, and I just wanna say, that's what happened to good Christian people in Germany. They didn't just to choose to, to worship the devil, but they made little compromises every day, every day, every day. And Bonhoeffer is saying, if you don't stand now and say this loudly now, we're all gonna, we're all gonna go down. It, it, now is your, your chance. And so I just feel like we've been so blessed in America. We're not used to standing up. We're not used to being countercultural. The culture has been vaguely Christian. And, and suddenly that has changed. And I guess, are we willing now to say, okay, Maybe I, need, maybe I need to change because in a year from now or two years from now, I, I won't be able to. So I'm... Yeah, help me out. Okay, because um, like I'm sitting here listening to you speak and honestly, there's a bit of me that's feeling a little bit of tension. Tell me. Okay. Um, I'm coming from San Francisco. No, no, tell me. Tell me okay. what you mean. No, I, yeah. I'm talking like this I am all day, day yeah. yesterday no, and today. He's usually so the one that's it. doing this to yeah. the other guys, so I'm yeah. doing it to you. Yeah. Now, I... Because, uh, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm in yeah. my mind going, okay, if someone from San Francisco watches this yeah. and I'm sitting up here, the whole LGBTQ thing, yeah. I mean, you know, and you're New York, so well, the, it's, it's The not question is, what do, what do I mean by it, right? That's, no, no, that's no, no, the no. point. No, it my, is, my question yeah. is, there has been a cautiousness of what I say publicly right. because I'm thinking, Gosh, I don't want to lose the opportunity to right. get the message right. to these people, right. and um, and and it's like I, I and so I'm always trying to be cautious, and that's what I'm concerned but that's what about. You said it's like five minutes ago, that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm like, gosh, I don't know if I'm doing this because I love them and I want them to hear the gospel, and I don't want to start with their sexuality. I want to start right. with the good. I want to start right. with an amazing king. Yes, you know, a God to be feared, yeah. and they won't even hear that because the moment they hear, you know, like yeah. what you just yeah. said, they won't listen to me well, anymore. What did I just say? Like, let's, let's I don't seriously. know. I no, just, but, but that's but, what I'm trying to say is, in other words, but I, no, I no, wasn't no. listening. No, but no, Francis, it, it no, was, you, but what it, you said, you but made what I'm saying is actually, this is the Mets thing, the, the, the Mets thing. Yeah. But what I'm, what I'm saying is like, I get this creepy feeling like it's no longer okay to say, okay, we live in a country and people have different views. And instead of saying nasty things about those people, as a Christian, I'm gonna say, you know what, we disagree, but I know Jesus loves you, and I will, I, will, I will love you whether you agree with me on these issues or not. Now, we're kind of being pushed a little bit. Everybody needs to celebrate. Every website yeah, 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 yeah. is rainbow colors. And I wanna say, that's really not okay. A line has been crossed, yeah. and nobody wants to talk about it, and I guess, there are times, and this is truly when, unless you have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, there is no right answer. And Germans were struggling with this in Germany. And I mean, look, when, when you read my book, um, 
you will see that there were there were evangelicals in Germany and even in the United States who were saying exactly this idea, like, listen, uh, we don't want to rock the boat. We just want to have the ability to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. We want to have the ability to preach. So we don't want to go up against Hitler and get political. We just want to preach the gospel. It's all about salvation. Now, imagine you're a Jew in a boxcar going to Treblinka with your kids. They got a crap in a bucket. The boxcar doesn't open up for days. You're going through a living hell and you're going to a camp to your death. Don't you Wait, hope and there's 18,000 pastors, nobody's speaking up. Don't you hope, as that Jew, that there's a Christian out there who cares about, about the gospel so much that he's willing to speak up about, about this injustice that everybody's not supposed to talk about? And I'm aware of the fact that, like, it's a, it's a fine line because I, listen, I used to yeah. be way more l like what you're describing, but I think Bonhoeffer and developments mm. in the last few years have kind of woken me up. Like at some yeah. point, and this is the difficult thing, at some point you have to come out of the closet, so to speak, and say, I believe this. The, the yeah. slavery thing's the same thing. Everybody told Wilberforce, shut up, keep your faith to yourself, don't mix your faith in politics, shut your mouth. In other words, there were people then who just said this is not appropriate? Well, and I think what what I, I I think what I'm reacting to is some. You know, there are Christians who have ad addressed the topic of homosexuality in the wrong way. Right. Exactly. You know, they've stood against it. Exactly. But they didn't do it in the right way. So you're we're trying to combat that right. and do it in the right way. Of course. But then sometimes you get so careful yeah. that pretty soon you're like, ah, oh, I don't say any you, you know, so it's like this this that, that's uh, no Eric, that's exactly Eric. what I'm that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. And and Bonhoeffer to me is the illustration of that where he was trying to say to the people in Germany, to the good Christians in Germany who said, hey, Romans 13, we don't speak against our leaders. And by the way, Hitler's doing all these good things. And trust me, folks, he did many great things. And most Germans had no clue. The first nine years, They had did many no things. clue where this stuff was going, okay? Mm. But Bonhoeffer was saying, listen, um, there were evangelicals who said, we need to convert Hitler. Now, who could disagree with that, right? You get around some hyper-faith people, and they're like, we need to pray, you know, we need to pray that the Antichrist would become a Christian. Uh, we need to pray that Hitler would become a Christian. We need to pray. Come on, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Wh who's going to disagree with that? Gonna go, okay, I guess, yeah, we got to pray. Otherwise, I'm in the flesh, so we got to pray. I mean, he does have a mother. And, and know, then, know. yes. And so then you think, hit, but, but Bonhoeffer was saying to these people, I mean, it really is in my book, because I was fascinated by this. He said to these people, I don't think you understand. In other you're not reading the times. Hitler is going to convert you. You're not converting Hitler. In other words, he had a discernment. And that's what Bonhoeffer was saying. Hitler's going to convert you. Yeah, they, he did. He, in other words, he had a discernment to say, like, I get where you're coming from theoretically, yeah. but if you're really listening to the Holy Spirit, you, you've got to speak up now, and this is what, what I think it boils down to, because you were saying it exactly, is that I think we in the church, especially evangelicals, have almost made an idol of evangelism, and we have forgotten that that's just a part of the gospel, right? In other words, the gospel means I'm going to speak the truth, and yes, perhaps somebody will be driven away from the faith, but at some point, I've got to trust God with their soul. It's not about what I say or don't say. Wow. And that's a, that's a tough discernment. I mean, it's, it, I'm not going to pretend that's easy because you need to care about that person's soul. But sometimes yeah. we've gotten silenced into caring about somebody's soul to the extent that we're, we're muzzled. No, it's really good. I, I really need to read the book. Okay, and uh, I, I will say, too, there, there's, there's like this, um, I, this, this preacher one time at a pastor's conference he came up one morning, he goes, you know what, the Lord said something to me. Um, this is the guy that took over for Piper, actually. I always keep forgetting, it's Jason Meyer. And he said, um, he goes, some of you are preaching for the absence of criticism rather than the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, whoa, that was of the Lord. Like, because what happens is anytime we say something, how much feedback? Me just saying, I like Mike Bickle. 
Oh my gosh, you, I got hammered. Wait. And then you think you, you have to respond. You didn't say that. I you did, didn't say I like, did. Like, no, you didn't. You said, I love Mike Bickle. <laughs> okay. I think that was the second year. Oh, yeah, the was. first year I just liked yeah, you, no, and that's, the second year, okay, you know what, I love no, you, and I will publicly no, say that true. I love you. That was the second year. And now I will admit, I, man, I'm in love with you. Okay, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I believe everything you believe or whatever, I'm just saying I really love you. Um, just read his book and then you'll understand. Yeah, yeah, then I'll say <laughs> whatever. Okay, but, but my point and what, what he was saying is it's a real thing, right? That we have felt like I don't want to deal with all the criticism because I just want to get to the gospel. But then you try to be careful, try to be careful, and you're like, and you right. subconsciously try to say everything just right. And then pretty soon you're not a prophet like, anymore. Say that phrase and again. You're not, that, that that's said. right. We preach, we preach for the absence of criticism instead of, instead of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that yeah. when the Holy Spirit tells I, you to say something, you just say it. It doesn't matter how anyone responds, but there is something that happens when you get so much criticism. It, it subconsciously does something to you, and you start, it's, it's like you don't even realize you're doing it. Like, ooh, if I say it like that, uh, you know, this lady's going to say this, and that guy's always going to do this. Da, 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 da. But, but isn't that the point is that no matter, I mean, look, I've learned this kind of the yeah. hard way, but, but in the last number of years and stuff, I've just gotten such nasty criticism. And I think at some point, you know, yeah. at, at one point, I think, I think a lot of Christians are over scrupulous yeah. and they say, well, well, I've got to respond to that. And I've got to respond. Did you think there's a scripture? Cast ye not your pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. There are people, they're not even slightly interested in your stupid little truth. Mm -hmm. They just want to bait you and make you feel bad. And that's the yeah. enemy. And to respond to that is foolishness. Yeah. And, and I think that a lot of times we act like, that oh, no, 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 because they might be earnest. And I, I need to respond on Twitter. And I, No, you don't. The Lord cares about their soul more than you do. And I, and, I, and I, but I mean, I really, I say that because I see people doing that. And I, and I just have discernment. It's like, you're wasting your time and you're wasting God's mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be responding yeah. that, but that person is not interested in mm -hmm. debating with you. They're just sucking your time away. But I will say this too on the, on the gay issue, okay? I keep thinking, here's what's never mentioned. There is a 15 year old who's sexually confused, a boy, okay? Will he ever hear anyone say, you know those same sex feelings you have sometimes? You don't need to follow that. God has a better plan for you. Now, if you love that young man, and there are millions of them, if you love them, you will speak to them. Absolutely. And you will put that truth out there lovingly and say, look, we've all got unwanted sexual attractions, and you think it's, it's good and true because it exists? Most of that is is dark and will lead you down a dark path and will destroy your life and your future, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, whatever, like whatever you have, there's all kinds of sexual stuff that, that is, is your enemy. But the message being preached is, well, whatever you feel, it's wonderful, whatever. Not, not you know, if you, if you have uh, same-sex attraction and, and attraction of the opposite sex, we're living in a culture now where people say, that same-sex attraction, that's you. And it's like, where did that come from? That, that's not even logical, right? And so these messages are going out. They're destroying lives. And I think if you have compassion on especially young people, they're never hearing this mm -hmm. because we're afraid to bring it up. And we're letting these really uh, bold lies rule the day and destroy lives. And I say, but, but if I talk about that, it'll, it'll lessen my witness. I would actually say in the end, it will strengthen your witness. I actually, now if you say it right and in love, and you will never get it right in the sense that we're, we're, we're broken. Like we're never gonna get it, get it right. I mean, actually, I, I joke about this. I always, when people criticize me if I say something, right? Because I, I never used to be as outspoken as I am now. And I try to be careful even now, of course, right? But when people say that stuff, I think to myself, hey, let's talk about Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow said everything perfectly. I, lo I love Tim Tebow, okay? But here's a guy, never says anything controversial, but he has been vilified and mocked and mocked. In other words, if you think doing everything right is, is people are gonna just be coming to faith in droves, yeah. 
Jesus said everything utterly perfectly. And so I think we, we kind of get trapped by our good intentions of wanting to bring everybody to faith, but it, but it takes us away fr from something, and we're afraid yes. to speak truth because we say, if I speak about that, it's totally going to neutralize agree. my witness. So. I totally agree. And, but the narrative has been, and it is true, that there are things that have been said by the Christian community yes. that have been so harsh yeah. and biblically right. yeah. inaccurate of, well, you know, whether that's a demon or yeah. this is, you, sure. you know, to where these people... Right. Um, that God loves have become suicidal. Sure. Because of, and, and to at least acknowledge that side, you know. I, I, I so, mean, but of course, of course you acknowledge yeah, yeah, it, but yeah. at the same time, you know, you have to but, be aware. I yeah. mean, look, I, you know I totally agree with no, that. No, totally. Just but, like I agree with but what I, But what I'm saying is that I think, I think where we have to be careful is the devil yeah. wants to take all the mistakes every Christian has ever made on this issue and beat us over the head with it and say, this is your sin, this is your sin, this is your sin. And I think we can all say, no. Uh, if I've ever participated in any of that, I repent. It is wrong. But now I'm going to move on in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to let you silence me because historically these people have done these things. It's just as, as when yeah. somebody says, well, you're white, and white people have done this and this and this and this. And you're saying, well, what is God's voice? God's, God wants us to repent of what we do wrong and to move on in joy. But the enemy wants to use these past sins as a cudgel to say, you will never get it right. You need to be full of shame and shut up and shut up and shut up. That's in a, def in a, in a nutshell, that's the cancel culture. Mm. In other words, eh, eh, rather than, I mean, I always say it's kind of like if you've got a kid and imagine if you say to that kid, you are no good. You'll never be any good. You're bad to the bone. You're just like your father. You're just like your mother. You are cursing that child. To love that child would be to say, you know, you might not be perfect, but I see where you've improved. I want to celebrate that. I want to celebrate that. I want you to be better. I want you to be better. So we've kind of bought into a larger narrative, mostly in America, that America is bad and we are bad. And I, I want to say that's the voice of the accuser. That's not the voice of God. And we know there's truth in that voice because the enemy will take truth and twist it and, and he will use it. And unless you know that all these sins that you're being accused of, it's like, yeah, yes, yes, yes. And guess what? The Lord died for all, one of the, all those sins and I accept what he did by faith and I'm free. I don't need to walk under that condemnation anymore. But culturally speaking, we've kind of bought into that and even the evangelical church has kind of bought into that because it, it feels good to feel guilty. It feels like I'm, I'm being right, righteous. Anyway, I didn't mean to get into all this. Where do so we, how did this happen? We're bringing this conversation to an end because we're gonna pick this up tomorrow. What you guys did in the last 10 or 15 minutes is that we shifted a little bit from Bonhoeffer to Luther, because Luther is the one that took the stand on the Word of God, Psalm 2. That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. So these subjects, we can finish them tomorrow under the Psalm 2 banner, because the Psalm 2 message is they're trying to drive the Word of God out of the culture, and that's what I connect with Luther, although Luther means a lot more than that. So we're going to pick this up, but I want to say a couple of real quick things and bring this to an end and then get you guys ready, Ken and Chris, for ministry time. You said about 10 minutes ago, people are making an idol out of evangelism. And what they don't, you might not know about him. I've watched many of his programs. He is a radical evangelist. He is trying to win souls in his program over and over. So when you say that, I go, I don't know they know you enough yeah. to where you're saying something important. And so I appreciate that. And as he, this guy over here, Francis, <laughs> was saying these things like I speak up, speak up. He was actually confessing that he's not speaking up enough. That's what I heard you saying. So you were actually agreeing with him. Not that the point is you got to agree with the whole thing, but you were saying, you know what? I have been quiet, but that's a bad thing that I've been so quiet. That's what I was hearing you say. Yeah, 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 definitely. And so, and, but then he would sometimes answer and say, you know, you need to or something, right. but da 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 da. Last thing on Bonhoeffer, I want to end with Bonhoeffer. The thing that I really loved about Bonhoeffer was his view of death. He had a view of the resurrection that set him apart from most of the theologians and leaders in Europe. And even unto the very end, he said, you know, Jesus has transformed death. I'm not afraid of it. 
His very last letter he wrote, like the day before he died, they smuggled it out. One of the guards did it for him. He wrote it to the Bishop Bell in, in England. He wrote, because he knew, I'm dying tomorrow. His last letter he wrote, this is the end, but actually it's just the beginning for me. Those, that was his last word he wrote. It's only the beginning for me. And then the week before, when they were driving to the final death camp, or 10 days before, and they knew they were going to Flossenburg, the actual death camp where they would be executed. It was clear 10 days before, because they were at another place. They're driving there, the, you know, the, 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 the vehicle, they were so terrified. And one guy survived it. He was not killed. And he gave the testimony later to Bonhoeffer's sister, uh, 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 his twin sister, Sabina. He said, somehow he survived. He goes, there are a, a truckload of us. We were terrified. But your brother spoke with such peace and tranquility, knowing we were dying in the next week. And he comforted all of these people on the way there. There was nothing like it. We've never seen anything like that. Then the final thing, and then you can make a comment on this if you want. It's so amazing. The doctor at the death camp, the German doctor, who was a doctor for 50 years, he had said, I have witnessed so many deaths. He didn't know who Bonhoeffer was. He, didn't, he wasn't a, into the Christian. He didn't even know who he was. He said, this young man, he's 39 years old, died in such submission to the will of God. He didn't even know what that meant. I've never seen a man with so much peace, go to the gallows, and with a bright face, died. And 10 years later, he told the story of this one guy back 10 years ago named Dietrich Bonhoeffer that he'd never heard of. And he gave his final witness was that Jesus was the resurrection. That was the strength of Bonhoeffer. Any comments you want to make? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just... The reason um, I think in retrospect the Lord called me to write these books is because when you look at a life, you get a fully dimensional view of what it is to be a Christian, right, to, to, to live. You can have a book that tells you all these different things, but to see it, I mean, Jesus tabernacled among us. He didn't kind of beam down, hand out some mimeograph sheets. He's like, I gotta go and leave. He lived among us so that the disciples could see him and live with him. And there's something about that. And that's, in, in retrospect, because I think, like, you know, as we, we talk about these things and we have these, you know, conversations and debates and stuff, at the end of the day, you realize there's really no right answer. You can't nail this down. Some of this stuff, you just have to, like, live it and ask God to help you to have discernment in the midst of it. And Bonhoeffer, to me, is the example of that, where a lot of people... At some point, they were like, oh, I'm out. I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. But he was willing to walk all the way to the end, losing more and more friends. Because people thought, this guy's gone nuts. I mean, it's he's one gone thing. Too far. I mean, they, the they kept, they gone kept too thinking far. he's gone too far. He's gone too far. But he realized more and more, I'm playing to an audience of one. God is my judge. And, and here's the key. If I get it wrong, I serve a God of mercy and grace and love. In other words, I think there were a lot of religious people thinking, if I screw it up, wow, God's gonna be so angry. So I, I gotta, I mean, the example I always use is, I say, if somebody comes, knocks on the door, it's the Gestapo, and they say, are you hiding a Jew in the basement? A religious German would say, oh, I can't tell a lie. Yes, I'm hiding a Jew in the basement. Help yourself. You can torture him and kill him, but I'm justified because I didn't lie. Great, I feel good right? about myself. Right, and Bonhoeffer looked deeper, and he said, no, um, that is a judgmental gotcha kind of God. I don't worship that God. Right, that agree. guy looks on the heart. And so if I hide a Jew and I have to tell a lie to like an evil Gestapo, uh, I, I think God's looking up at my heart. He's not trying to catch me in illegalism. But there were many people in Germany that they were neutralized by their religiosity. They were afraid I, I, I've been trained always. Uh, I, I can't even tell a white lie because, 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 because. And the Nazis and the devil will cynically use that and get you to say things or not say things or whatever. So if you're really looking to the Lord, you say, Lord, I'm going to do this. I'm in Barnabas' case, I'm going to get involved in a plot to assassinate the Fuhrer. I don't do that lightly. 
And if I am wrong, Lord, I cast myself on your mercy because you're a good God. But he said, I cannot sit on my hands and just say, I'm not going to do anything because I'm afraid I might make a mistake. Mm. Last words. That's it. Yeah, I, not really words. I'd, I'd love to pray for us. I don't know if you guys believe in that. But uh, <laughs> only if you pray in tongues. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going I'm to I'm make a final comment, and then we're going to pray, okay? No, no, no. My comment, is, are you using, about tongues? No, no. no. Let's oh, okay, not get into okay, okay, okay. I almost made a comment. I, I, about what we're doing tomorrow no. is we're talking about Luther. And of course, you're an expert on Luther far more than me, but when I think of Luther, I connect him with standing for the Word of God against the uh, political and religious persecution. So that's what yeah. I put in Psalm 2. And we're going to talk about some of the issues the last 10 minutes, even yeah. more of them, because that's in my mind, the Luther conversation, though it fits okay. tonight. But we're not done with that conversation is what, okay. what I want to say, number one. Number two, we're going to have a... Uh, 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 we're going to be have a patient ministry time now. We're going to be here for a little while, just waiting on the Lord. We're going to do that tomorrow night as well. And uh, Eric is going to have a book signing of the Bonhoeffer book at the end of the ministry time, not during it. So if some of you, we got a bunch of those books back there, or maybe you bought it before. He's happy. He likes to do that. Some people love that. <laughs> They'll be right over there, and, but it's after the ministry time. So I appreciate you staying around because you've had a very Save long Save one for days. me. Okay. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll be the first one. Okay, now. And I had to push it to Luther because I didn't read the book. And I did watch the movie on Luther. Okay. Um, but I, I wanted to pray for us because I'm praying for myself up here. And I'm realizing, God, I have done things and said things or not said things. And I thought I was doing it in the name of love good, when good. I was possibly a coward. And then there are other times when I have said things thinking I was bold, but I did it unloving, and so I was a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So you were quiet, but it was cowardice, and you were bold, and you were angry. So yeah, it was the opposite yeah, 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 yeah. of what you were aiming for. And sometimes I don't know if I'm truly being loving, but I'm really being a coward. And sometimes I, I, I don't know these things. And I thought there's probably other people who struggle with this because I'm saying, God, God, I'll say whatever. You want me to just, just scream it right now? I'll say it. Just, I just got to know because I've made mistakes in my life. I've bashed people like you. I have. I, it's come out of my mouth. So then you get scared. Like, well, I said that so boldly and I didn't even know what I was talking about. And so all these things start feeding in your mind and it takes away some boldness because you've said some things wrongly. And so it puts yeah, this yeah. fear and then you're, you, you, all these things add to it. And I'm going, God, I need your spirit so badly because I don't want to end my life as a coward. I, I want to say whatever you tell me to say. And I want to have this love. And so I just, I want to believe in this moment because I, I really am going, God, I need you so desperately. I need you so desperately because I don't know how to do this. This conversation is real. Like, okay, help me with this. Help me with this. And, and he's not going, okay, well, I've got the perfect answer. He's going, no, I've done it wrong too. And I just want that blessing where I go, God, I, I don't want my heart to stray from you. God, I want to abide in you. God, you promise, Lord, that, that if we hear you and we open the door that you're here with us, you're eating with us, your presence is right here with us. But Lord, we want to hear you. Like, like I want to know at those moments, Lord, if I'm being a coward, God, I I don't want to be a coward. I want to say whatever, like straight to someone's face, whatever you tell me to say. And yet, God, I don't want to be proud, Lord, and I don't want to say things absent of love, and I've done that. And God, I don't want to be wrong about your word, and I've been wrong, and I've been wrong about people. And, and so, God, we are just begging you right now, please, Lord, 
Please keep us from the flow of this world and the wide road that leads to destruction. We need your spirit, Lord, to speak boldly in love, God. We need you. I need your spirit to pray right now as I ought. I, don't need, I haven't even prayed to you properly so many times, God. And so, God, to talk to another human being and to dare talk about holy matters, sacred things, God. Oh, God, we don't want to misrepresent you. And so out of fear, sometimes we don't say things, and I'm scared I'll say it wrong again. So, God, I, I'm just begging for help right now, Lord. And I know you want to give it to us. And you promise you would give us wisdom if we ask for it. So God, I believe in this prayer right now that you will give us wisdom in when to speak up and how to say it. Because I'm asking God, and I confess, I was a little bit almost like worried about it. It's because I was doubting this prayer. And that type of prayer won't receive anything. Your word tells me that if I ask for wisdom, you will give it to me. You promise that. I thank you, Lord, that from this moment on, I will speak with more wisdom. I will have more wisdom to speak up and to say whatever I need to say at the right time, that your spirit will lead me and direct me. And so, Father, I pray for that faith in everyone in this room, for those who have been discouraged and beating themselves up because they've said things wrong or they haven't spoken up. Lord, that was before. That was before this prayer. We're asking for wisdom. We're asking for courage. And we're so grateful that we have an all-powerful God who hears us. And we're at peace, Lord. We're not anxious about this. We're at peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, right now. Thank you for hearing us from heaven and changing us because of your true and wonderful promises. Thank you for tonight. We love you. We love you. Keep us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, kind of spontaneous. Is Helen, who led worship, is she here? Helen? She's here. If you'll come up, I would like to lead, the, at least the musicians. I don't know if all the singers are here. I'd like to just, maybe about 10 minutes, let's all stand. We're not going to take a break, but I want you to stand so people in the middle can slip out if they need to. But we're going to just stand just to stretch a little bit. But I just want us to worship for a few minutes. And there was such a sweet presence in the way that you were leading. Just stay in that vein. And again, I'd like not to have conversations. Just stay, just because th this isn't actually a break. You're just giving people a chance to slip out. You need to go to the restroom, make a phone call, come right back for about 10 minutes. And, and Ken Fish, come on up. And Chris Reed, come on up. And just stand up here and just begin to prepare your heart. And Sorry, I did. Oh, yeah, you know what? We probably need you guys to stay here because we're going to kind of ebb and flow. I forgot to mention that to you. Like in the ministry time, too. Yes, as well. So thank you for being flexible and available. You want to move that chair out of the way? Here, like, give that to the other guy. Yeah. Lord, here we are before you. We say, come Holy Spirit, come and touch us.
Holy Spirit, manifest your presence in this room. I love your presence. I love the love. I love you, Jesus. I love the love. I love your presence. In the glory. fish to you now I've known you for some years and many of you know that I was a part of the vineyard for eight years a vineyard pastor traveled with John Wimber and uh, from 1988 for some years and Ken was together with John Wimber and actually wrote many of his materials so he was kind of his ghostwriter behind the scenes a lot of his syllabi and 
traveled about 50 different conferences with him, and this, the Lord's used him in signs and wonders for many years. And so he has stayed with it. And you were in those early days when we, the group from Kansas City, Paul Kane, Bob Jones, we would come to Anaheim, and you were a part of that. When the Lord spoke the compassion and worship, prophetic and intercession, and you remember all that story, we've talked about it. And one thing I appreciate about you is that, and that 33 years ago, you have sought to be, to walk in the grace of God of those four things, because the Lord wanted those to come together. So just give us a few moments uh, about what's happening in your heart and ministry, and then they're going to give a couple small uh, little soundbite teachings throughout these ministry times tonight and tomorrow night, and, you know, just maybe five or seven minutes on something, and then do ministry time, and then we might do a little worship, and then just kind of ebb and flow from that. So, Ken, I love it, and I love that you two are buddies. You know, you've been close for about a year and a half, and uh, you, <laughs> no, I love it, and, and we were at Rick Joyner's together, and so he's been kind of like the old guy helping the young guy, your mid-30s, your early 60s. I know 60, but that's Don't early 60s. Up, that is early 60s, 60. You're on my generation. But anyway, and I just love the way you love him, and I love the way that, you've, that you're receiving from him, and having you both here together is a joy to me. Thanks, Mike. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, it was a long time ago that I first came to Kansas City. Uh, you guys all came out to Anaheim. But, Bunch of times. Yeah, but, but we all came here. Yes. I mean, like 100 from Anaheim came twice. Yeah. 100 people from the Anaheim Church with John Wimber. So if there are any people around who remember those days. Was anybody here in this room? Ah, I see that hand. One hand. Any, anybody else? Oh, oh, look, wait, wait, wait. There's some little hands. Paul, raise your hand. My son, he's only eight, but he was here. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably in the back room doing stuff, but anyway. <laughs> Well, so we, uh, my wife and I, my wife's on the front row here. Her name's Beth. She, you Beth, go ahead and stand up just so we can wave that. at you. So we were, uh, we were younger. We were thinner. I had more hair. Uh, but 30 years ago. Yeah, 38. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, we... We came and we experienced what you had, and as Mike said, the, the intent of the Lord was that there'd be a mingling of what the vineyard had with what at the time was known as Kansas City Fellowship, what you guys had. and uh, The prophetic intercession cross-pollinating from Kansas City with the compassion and worship of the vineyard movement. So um, anyway, that, that got started. And then somehow it went into suspended animation. So we're hoping that something of that will reignite this weekend. That's kind of the, the Because goal the Luke here. 418 was critical to us back then. And then when Chris came and he had this riddle, when the prince shall pass, 418 at last. And that spoke really to us from 32 years ago. Right. Because the vineyard's kind of hallmark verse was Luke 418. Um, and there, again, most of this stuff could be unpacked at multiple layers, so I'm not going to do that. We'll use up all the time unpacking it. But um, Mike wanted to have a, a healing time tonight, and there'll be some prophecy mixed in with it. And one of the things that I learned many years ago, and I didn't, I didn't come to it easily, is that most of this stuff happens by the moving of the Holy Spirit. And one of the hardest things there is, at least for a guy like me back then, I'd just come out. Eric went to Yale, and I went to Princeton. So these are heady places, and, you know, we spent a lot of time in our head. And so when I first showed up at the vineyard, you know, John would say, there's the Holy Spirit. He's moving. You see that? And I'd go, I don't see anything. What's he talking about? And, and I really struggled with that for a long time, but I was, I was determined that if he could do it, John kept saying, you can learn to do this. I figured if he can do it, I can do it. So I just kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And I don't know if I'm as good as John was. It, it's, at this point in my life, I don't know my, if I'm as good as John was then. But anyway, I've done what I can, and so I try to But well, the Lord's that. using you quite a bit in the last few years. Sometimes, I know that for a fact. Yeah. Yeah. 
as Paul Cain used to say, even a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> Anyway, so one of the things I learned from John is that, <clears throat> is that following the leading of the Spirit is, is, it's not just important, it's essential. Even Jesus said, I can only do what the Father shows me to do. And so, you know, Chris and I have talked about this a lot. We function in some ways the same, it's like a Venn diagram, you know, there's some overlap in the middle. In some ways we function the same, some ways we're very different. But the one thing we both do is we follow the leading of the Spirit as we understand that, and over time we get better and better at it, and so things happen. But when it comes to the realm of healing, one of the things that I learned most particularly, this is supposed to be a five to seven minute teach, right. cheat chat, right? Yeah, a little sound bite. I yeah. called it a teaching sound bite. Okay, so <laughs> this is the sound bite. Uh, is that power, the power of the Spirit is essential in this. Now, it, it looks a little different when we're in the realm of the prophetic versus the realm of healing, but just a couple of verses, I'll quote them and not, uh, not read them. Luke 4.14, 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And apparently that wasn't the case with him before his baptism and his time in the wilderness. So there's a couple lessons we can learn from that. Testing is not always bad, it's just hard. But hard isn't bad, hard is hard. And testing ends. For Jesus, it was 40 days. For us, it might be longer than that. We're not Jesus. He only needed 40 days. And besides, there was reasoning behind 40 days. But Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And then throughout Luke's gospel, we see over and over again that the power was with him. Luke 5, 17, the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Um, Luke 6, and I can't remember the address. I want to say Luke 7, 6, 17, but I could be off on that verse. The chapter is right. Um, there was power coming out of him, and everyone who touched him got healed. And then Luke 8, 46, evidently the woman with the issue of blood, we all know that story, she evidently missed the healing meeting in Luke 6, but she'd heard about it, so she's like, if I can just touch him, I'll get healed. She does, and she does, meaning she touches him and she does get healed. So there are some other verses, but, but that's enough to establish the, the point that power is a, is a critical thing. And I think one of the things we sometimes miss in the way we teach healing in the modern period is it's all about what do we say or what do we believe? And I, th I think what we say and what we believe matters. But even Paul said, my message and my preaching were not with words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power. And so w what, somehow we have to find our way to that power. I mean, there's some things that we could talk about, but that would take me beyond my allotted time. So I'm, I'm being brief. We'll have more tomorrow, maybe. But we want to get to that place where the Lord's power can move and many times we've seen great outpourings of power and sometimes it's less so and there's things that titrate that make it greater or less but I want to focus on the power not the confession tonight I want to focus on on just that God's spirit would be able to move as he will by the way that is his chosen pronoun for those who get the joke. <laughs> um, but I, I, I would love to see the Spirit of God have that liberty to move with that kind of power. And so when, we, when it says Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, there's something about that that breeds a kind of confidence in God. And in this case, the word confidence and faith are nearly synonymous. And so it isn't just the what we believe, it's that sense of, I know that God is good to his word. And I think we're in a season where the Lord wants to unveil that once again. He did it, he's done it at different times, eras and epochs of the church. Uh, that was one of the vineyard's hallmark things. But, but I think we're in a time where we really need that power to be unveiled. 
And so when, when Jesus came into the synagogue in Capernaum, he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And I know it says because he has anointed me, but let's just slightly change it without changing the meaning so you'll catch what I'm saying. He has empowered me. He, he's, he's released his divine power within me in order to preach good news and to set the captives free. And so ultimately when we talk about healing, we're talking about freeing people from whatever they're caught in, whatever bondage they're in, sicknesses, etc. And so if I, if I may dare to do it, you can shut me down if, no, I, if you want. No, dare. But when, when the three of you were up here, you, Eric, and Francis, we were talking about the whole LGBTQ question and how difficult it is. It's actually not that difficult. What? The, what the, because, well, the right and wrong of it is pretty clear from the Word of God. And what we've, what we've come to in, in the church today is that, you know, on the left... Now, this is my right, but for you, it's the left. So on the left, it's like, do anything you want, it's all good. And on the right, it's been, don't do it, God hates it. But there is a middle way, which is, God wants to set you free from it. And part of the malaise on the modern church is that we have no confidence in God. I'm back to that word that's a surrogate for faith. Most of our churches don't know anything about the power of God. They are disempowered. They're weak and anemic. But we see thousands of people freed of this all the time. Literally thousands. Freed of what? Freed of any form of LGBTQ plus you might want to name. It happens. Now, I'm not going to give an LGBTQ altar call right now, but I do want to offer you hope. But you've given is, those altar calls over the last couple I of have, years. I have, yeah. I gave one in Indianapolis about two months ago, and half the room came forward. And the power fell. It was epic. And, and, and what does that mean? The power fell. What's that mean? When, when, got, yeah. like, help me picture that. When the, when the power of God comes, there is usually something visible. Usually. Sometimes it's less obvious to the, to the untrained eye. That's why early on I was like, what's he talking about? When John Wimber would say, there's, there's the Spirit of God moving. But... Anyway, in Indianapolis, um, the Holy Spirit came on people. Many of them were visibly moved, shaking, weeping, falling out under the power of God. Um, but there were a number of them that were touched. And we, I just want to, I just want to, I, I wanted to reinsert that, even though I don't think that's the ministry t call tonight. It might be tomorrow or maybe next week. But I don't think that's the call tonight. But I, because it's in the air, because we touched it but didn't really go there, Here's what I've learned seeing many people get free of this is that most people that are in that, it's not just that they've been bullied or whatever. That, that might also be part of it. I wouldn't deny that. But they hate it. They hate themselves. And, and they want to get out of it, but they don't know how to get out of it. And, you know, Eric's going to talk tomorrow about Luther. One of Luther's great treatises was the bondage of the will. And many people who are caught in this are in bondage. It is as though they are in chains. And that can be on many different levels. Now let's move off of the LGBTQ question. There are people who are heterosexual who are in bondage. They're enslaved to pornography. There are people who are in bondage and they're, they're crazy in their heads. You know, they've got a mental illness, as we call it, or whatever. I mean, there are many different ways that people can be in bondage. But Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He's come to set me set people free. And so whom the Son of Man sets free is in fact free. I'm changing the language of the Bible only slightly, but not changing its meaning, just because sometimes we fall into a rut quoting it as it is written, and with that we lose the pungency of what it means. And so I really believe that God's charter for Christians is to be free of anything that would bind and constrain you, physically, mentally, sexually, whateverly. We're the, it is for freedom that he set us free. That, that's really it. That's the, that's the charter of Jesus. That's I, my teach at. I agree. <laughs> Thank you.
You want to start? You want me to start? No pressure. <laughs> That's good to be back. Uh, hey, Chris, this group loves you. He sends us, about eight or ten of us that we're interacting with him on a regular basis, one-liners about every week. I love you guys so much. I want to come back. This is my family. And so he really is at the heart level connected to this group. Yeah. So I'm just going to step out on this one. Um, I don't have anything clear yet. A lot of times when I minister like this, it's after being under the anointing of preaching. So this is not as usual for me, but here's what I do believe that the Lord has shown me. People in the room, parents um, who have children, and I think particularly a younger child, with some type of very unique name condition. Um, I don't know if this, if you have a baby or an infant or 10 or under that has a condition, a health condition with a unique name, would you just stand up and lift up your and, hand? And what's a unique name? Like, a, what do you mean? I don't have it yet, oh, but... Oh. But anybody that has a child with a unique... It's probably polysyllabic, meaning multiple syllables, and sounds very medical. Okay, I'm trying to... I saw somebody point. Yeah, just keep standing. Yeah, just, just keep standing. With the baby. You got one right there. And if you stand, wave your hand because, some, because it's kind of hard to actually see. It's okay, so we see you, you guys, those two and three. Okay, I think what I'm seeing, help me, Holy Spirit, once we get in the vein, things will get better. Hey, and there's no hurry. I think it's a we're, biracial we're not going couple. Right now. Yeah. I think a biracial couple with a young child is that person in here? Wait, someone's waving way at the back, right there. There they are. Okay, right back there. Are you guys right. biracial? I can't. But I don't, I don't know either one of you, right? I, I, I have no, if that's true, lift up your hand. We've not talked or communicated. You've not told me anything, that's true. As far as I know, I've never seen you in my life. I don't think we've ever spoken even, is that, is that right? Um, and I don't know, uh, as, as I get more in the vein of this, um, and I don't know if this is you, but it's like I'm seeing, just a minute, I'm seeing a doctor talk about the, the need or possibility or of something about organ transplant. All right. No, no, that's okay. I'm hearing something like Mita, Mito Fanoff, or something like that. It's a strange. So anybody that that's true, there, there's the biracial couple back there. But anybody that's true, lift up your hand if that's true. If you've got a child with a health condition. So we do, ha we do have a few. I'm seeing also some, uh, someone, I think it's a child, its name starts with a B. Um, so Lord, right now, every parent that this is true for, with a child with a stomach condition, health condition, I just speak healing right now. We rebuke the spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus. How many will agree with me right now that God is bringing healing right now to these children 
with these unique conditions. And we just declare from this moment forward, Satan, you cannot have them. And they are going to live a childhood free of sickness and disease in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have something, go ahead. I'm just, want, I'm just wondering, do we have somebody in this section here, or maybe it's back up into the bleachers, but it's in this zone. I think you're probably, I think you're on the floor. I think you're about maybe two-thirds to three-quarters of the way back. You've got a problem in your left hip right here. Gives you pain and mobility limitation. And you're, I think you're here, but you may be up in the bleachers. Who is that person? That's off target, though. We, we'll pray for you. No, no, don't sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. But part of, part of what we're looking for is for the Lord's accuracy. So yes. God meets the faith of those who come. Remember the lady in Luke 6, she didn't, or Luke 8, she didn't make it to the Luke 6 meeting. So you're in the wrong section, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get healed. <laughs> That's right? a joke. A joke. What's that? That's a joke. Yeah. So you're, you're good. Just, just hang on. But who's the person right in here? I saw this when I was sitting in the front row while we were worshiping. Nobody? I am a false prophet. Oh, is that you? There we go. Okay, I was wrong. Wasn't on the floor, just a little bit back. And that wouldn't make you a false prophet. I know you're joking. I know, but, I am joking. But everyone right. doesn't know that. You're not, mis you're not false. Do, why did you, you sit down? Don't sit down. And it's not exactly right. Stand up again. Don't, don't sit down. All right, we're going to pray for both of these two women. So this woman here is the one I was looking for. And this woman, oh, and we got another one here. Now people are standing up because they all want it. <laughs> so we're gonna pray. Those around, just lay hands on them. This is the left hip. It's right here in the flexor area. And we're just gonna wait one moment. Father, we thank you so much for giving these words. And we thank you for the faith of those who grabbed onto a word. Now, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and we ask you for your power. Lord, we just talked about how the power is what does everything. And now we speak to these hips, we speak to this area on the left, and we command healing to come in the name of Jesus. Lord, release a witness in their body. Let them feel the power of God let them feel heat, let them feel tingling, whatever it's gonna be, but Father, we speak to that and we say, give them a physical witness in their flesh of healing coming to them. Now let it be. Yes. Receive that in Jesus' name. Now our first lady who stood up is getting hit a little bit with the spirit, and this woman here a little lighter, and our other woman back there already sat down. Are you already healed? You look like you're embarrassed. Am I embarrassing you? I don't mean to embarrass you. I don't know what to do with her. She's, she's not giving me any feedback. And you're the one I was looking for. Yes, no, maybe. Now she's nodding. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. If it's not a yes, do me a favor. Come up here to the front, and I'm gonna sick my daughter and son-in-law on you. They're both really anointed at this and we'll finish it off if you aren't already healed. The woman back there. If you're good, just stay where you are. Chris? Amen. There's something on that whole word about, I'm, I'm not, that's not guesswork about the child. The Lord is doing something in a child's life tonight. So the word, this is strange, and I don't know exactly what it means, but Blue River Blue River. I don't even know. Well, that, that, that's a major street right here. Okay. So everyone knows we, Blue River. Anybody that's connected to that. I, I'm not familiar with the area, so Blue River. You mean do they live on it? Is that what you mean? Uh, or, or anything. Something like, it's something like 109 or something very close to that. Where? 
Wave, wave if it's you. Is that you? Pardon me? Okay. This is something with, okay, so that's true for you? Is there somebody else? 109th Street on Blue River, next to Blue River. Yeah. Okay. So that's address, 10909 Blue River Road. Okay. So you have something so, for this? So yes. Also, I think that there's something... I think it's a woman. Uh, I'm seeing a woman with the middle name Lee. Oh, that's you and you live at 109 Blue River and your middle name's Lee? Really? We don't know each other? That's a unique name, by the way. I'm not... Uh, well, for a, a woman, I would well, think it would not be. Well, it's not Leroy, but it's Lee. Yeah, there's a whole... <laughs> <clears throat> That's a family joke to those visiting. They don't get it. You don't need to get it. Anyway, let's stay focused, yeah. I don't remember whatever the number was I said a minute ago. What 109 Blue River. 10909 Blue River, and her middle name's Lee. So, you know, the enemy loves, he would love to bring... I don't know if this may, this may, are you a, like, I keep seeing, like a judge. I, I don't think that you're a judge. Your first name's Deborah, female judge. Okay. We're getting there. We're getting there. Pardon me? Chapter five of Judges. Middle name's Lee. Blue River, the blue meaning healing. I really feel like that there is a stream of healing that the Lord is going to flow through you. And, and the verse that I am, there's a verse that um, speaks of something along the lines of that the, the woman wouldn't be a widow and that the child wouldn't be fatherless or something like that. I just break any attempt of the enemy in your life or your past to bring tragedy removing the enemy was the enemy has wanted to remove and in some ways he's been successful but to take out to remove male figures in your family does that register to you pardon me your son died wow The, the son died and the father was murdered. Ten years ago, the father was murdered. And a year ago, the son died. Now, we've never spoken. We've never communicated. I don't know you. I don't, we've never talked. Is that true? Lift up your hand. Um, there's another name, too, and I don't know if it's something. It's, I don't know if it's something that starts with an N. It's a unique name, like... I haven't got it quite right on the tip of my tongue, but there's something like I'm seeing that, you know, Tom and Jerry. Uh, so, the, so the Lord, I, I see you smiling, so, okay. What is it? Her son's name was Tom, yeah. What's the last name? Nowig. That's the name, that's the word, that's the name that starts with an N. Was that the one that, that you lost. Yes, to better like speak for us so we can hear you. I want to break the spirit of tragedy. I feel that right now. Now we're getting in the flow. We're getting in the flow. The Lord loves unique services like this, these, these formats, but I want to tell you there are people in this room that the Blue River of Healing wants to bring healing to their home, their hurts, the things that, the tragedies that have brought hurt and harm. Lord, let that blue mantle fall upon this dear lady. Father, I just pray right now 
in the name of Jesus Christ that depression cannot set in. Does that make sense to you? You know what I'm talking about. The enemy would love for depression. You're a psych nurse. Well, there you go. I think we're in the flow now. That's good. I've never seen the woman. I've never talked to her, not connected to her in any way. That's true. So Lord, right now, I just pray that every person that she ministers to is a psych nurse, that she will have healing, not just flow to her, but through her. And so that she will have a ministry to those who wait, have wait, come wait. through tragedy and loss. When he's prophesying, don't do the clapping till afterwards so he can finish it and they can hear it. Then you can clap. Go ahead. And anybody else, stay standing. The Holy Spirit's all over you. That's one of the manifestations Ken's talking about. So Lord, I also ask you to touch even her vocal cords right now and strengthen her lungs. Now, Lord, I just declare right from this moment that she's going to have strength in her voice, strength in her lungs, strength in her body. Lord, we just declare no weak spells are going to be able to thrive in her life or in her daily life. And here's another thing, uh, this, this whole depression, wouldn't it be just like the enemy, someone who's a psych nurse to, to be attacked with darkness and depression? But we just break that off of you in the name of Jesus. Go ahead. I just want to ask you a follow-on question. It, it's hard to answer in front of 1,800 of your best friends, but have you had not so much suicide, but have you had thoughts of death being fixated on it would be better or I'm, I'm ready to go now? Nothing like that. That's not, but that's not the thing. Sometimes when, when we get hit with tragedy, Paul talked about this, right? We were under so much pressure in the province of Asia that we despaired of life itself. That hasn't happened despite your son and your husband. Okay, then I won't. I'll just leave it right there. Okay, I see. Um, you, you can be seated. That There's not only a healing that a completed healing in you, but through you. And you're going to have a blue river of healing to be able to speak, counsel, minister to people who have experienced loss and tragedy. Your trials and your difficulties and your loss has not going to waste. It's not gone to waste. Um, so I see this... Um, I'm trying to interpret what I'm seeing here. The word love, almost like on the arm. I don't know if it's like um, words. Like a tattoo is what you think? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, Anybody I don't, got love perhaps. tattoo on their arm? Okay, go ahead and stand up if you do. If you've wow. got that on your arm, stand up. Wait, there's... Let the love of God be the strength that carries you with arms. Let the love of God carry each of you. Lord, so I, for some reason I see like Ezra the scribe. Ezra the scribe. And what does that mean to you? Her middle, Your middle name, name is, is Ezra. Ezra. Good. Um, Ephesians, well, no, 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 the rest of you keep standing. No, that, yeah. this, this word's for her, but it's also for the rest of you. Ephesians yeah, 3, 19. Where's it at? Can I see it? Love suffers long and is kind. So I'm seeing Ephesians 3, 19. Somebody read. If her your birthday's birthday 3, is 19. 3, 19. But what's Ephesians 3, 19 say? That's great. That's just an added blessing. Somebody read Ephesians 3, 19. It's that you would comprehend the fullness of the love of God so you could walk in the fullness of God's purpose. That you might be filled with the fullness of God. So the verse itself is about love and God has written his love not only on your in your nature as you've written it on your arm. And I feel like as you're perfected in love, you'll be filled with the fullness of God as you mature into agape. And I declare in the name of Jesus that God is going to use you as a bridge to the races. Lord, I thank you that she will even speak into the lives of Palestinians and Arabs and Jews. 
She's, she's, that's her background, yeah. So Lord, we just declare the Isaiah 19 mandate upon her life. Lord, that you're gonna raise up a people. Oh, that, now that's what we call a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 319, Ephesians 319, the love of God, being filled with the love of God and filled up with the fullness of the measure of God. Thank you, Lord. So your middle name's Ezra, your birthday's 319, you got love on your arm. And Which your is Arab, in 319, the Arab word love. and part Jewish, and Isaiah 19 is one of her passions. I mean, I know her, she's been around for years here. Okay, but I don't know her you. Her first year's Danielle. Danielle. The Lord knows all of us, doesn't he? But the Ezra, nobody knows her middle name. Okay. Um, but her passion is the Isaiah 19, the bridging of those in the Middle East. That's what's really As God. <laughs> That's why it's touching. I, now we're in the anointing. I thought we we're going to struggle for a minute, but now the, the anointing's here. <laughs> so Lord, I just declare that not only for this uh, dear sister, but for every person in this room, they'll walk in their biblical mandated purpose that love would be tattooed upon their heart Just wait, let, let and that finish. they would be filled with all the fullness of God to be a bridge to the different races, to be able to minister reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation which you've given to the body of Christ. Lord, just let it happen in these racially tense times. Let the body of Christ be the healing balm of Gilead in this hour. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So it's not winter, it's not spring, it's not fall, it's summer. Now, we'll, we'll <laughs> keep moving forward with this. I don't know exactly if that if that's a name of someone or if it's speaking to you seasons mean summer is that the name summer is that what you're asking i i yeah i mean obviously we're in summer it's not is anybody winter. named summer in the room right there you are in you're living up to your name you are in the prime season of your life are there so i'm seeing which one of you like uh, wait there's a summer up there too wave Wave so we can see it. No, which one yeah. is my scene? It's like two daughters and a son, maybe. Or that that's right? her, she's got two daughters, and I, I, I know her. That's summer. She's okay. her son. I know her well, actually. Thank but, you. And the other one, keep standing, don't sit down so quick. If you sit down, just stay right in there and say, Lord, hurry up. Thank you, Lord. So, what about the two daughters and the son? I like, I really like them. So, so something else, I don't know if you do art or, or you are yeah, a painter. Yeah, she does art. She's really involved in art. She's a very art good artist. Ministry. Because the gifting of the ministry of art. She's and you know really how to, good at art. Yeah. You know how to paint a picture. But it's weird. It's like I keep seeing something like. Um... Wait, if the daughters are close to her, have them stand are, up. Are the. Yeah, they're right next to them. <laughs> there they are. They've been here like for 15 years. We love these guys. Thank you, Lord. Rick, go ahead and stand up. I mean, you're the hubby. <laughs> There's the son. There's the son. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for Rick. anything for those daughters that comes to you. I love them. <laughs> The Lord's gonna have, by the way, there's gonna be people that are gonna leave here tonight. You're gonna have, you're gonna be like a twin in the spirit. I just, I just heard that. And even though these two look very much alike, um, Lord, I just pray that prophetic intercession, mantle and anointing over these two daughters, Lord, that they'll raise up in the fullness of their purpose with a unique gifting on both of them, healing and prophecy. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this man. What did you say his name was? Rick. Rick. 
So Lord, I thank you for Rick. And I thank you, Lord, that even it's, his name was mentioned by someone here tonight. I don't know if it's New York or New York City. I know Eric is from there, but I keep seeing like, um, what is it? Was, was it uh, Times Square Church? Does that mean anything to you? I, I don't wave, wave if that means something to you. Okay, what does it mean? David Wilkerson. His last name is Wilkerson. Okay, good. And Times Square Church is David Wilkerson. That's her last name. So, Lord, I thank you for that connection. I couldn't remember the man's name, but I thank you for the connection to New York City, to Times Square Church. Lord, I thank you that right now you are going to put them right in the middle of your purpose and your will. And I pray, Lord, right now for this family and someone, I, um, I don't know if the Lord's wanting me to tell you that he's the potter and I see Clay. That's her brother, yeah. Stay with Clay, just stay with that one. <laughs> Clay's her brother. He's one of our worship leaders. Okay. So, Lord, I thank you for Clay, and I thank you that he is moldable in your hand and that he will live up, Lord, to that identity on the potter's wheel. Lord, I just pray right now that the lives of these, there's a shaping pressure being applied at times. Right now. That's, right that's now. No, I that's see, actual. That's true. There is pressure, various situations, family situations, yes. even, um, Lord, I'm just praying that the provision of heaven would, resources would open up to them in a whole new way, that they will not have to worry about money and finances, but that they can fulfill wait, wait, just wait, the wait, greater wait. purposes of God. And that, Lord, that they will paint a, as our sister here, will paint a picture of what God is doing in this hour. There is, it, it's like I see a painting of the world. And the Lord is saying, I'm zeroing in and I'm going to show you my purposes. So Lord, I just pray right now for that eagle anointing on paper. I don't know everything that I'm saying, but the Lord knows exactly. Do you know, does that make sense to you? The eagle it, anointing and, and on paper. And tell us, what is that the, what she paints? Rick, say it out loud. We can't quite hear So the hand lettering, you write the word. So let that word eagle, as Lord, as she's being pushed out of her nest, let this family soar to heights they never have. And I declare, Lord, there's going to be a family unity and a family oneness, a koinonia fellowship. And there's someone who is a, a man. It's not in your... Uh, these people, but I think it's someone that you're connected to, a man who's had various si significant health issues. And right, right now, the Lord right. is touching this man, who I believe is about in his 60s or something like that. The Lord is ministering this to is him right, right He's now. In his 60s, and I right. declare, sorry? Where's he at? Oh, Robert, right there. Wave, Robert. That's him, right? I didn't know you were Hallelujah. There. So I just declare a few things. Here's what the enemy would love to destroy. He would love through blood. I don't know why the Lord is highlighting blood. Blood sugar, blood pressure, heart in different conditions and different things. But Lord, I'm asking right now for you to touch Mr. Edward. Yes, Edwards? that's his last name. Yeah. Mr. Edwards, from the top of his head to the soles of his Wait, feet. Wait, I'm going to have his wife. I'm not going to say her name. Have her stand up too. This is a family affair here. They've been such a rock family here for literally 20 years. So Edwards is their last name. You're right. I don't know exactly what this would pertain to. My mom's name is Donna. 
That's the woman who just stood okay. up. Okay. Her name is Donna Edwards. She just stood up. Yeah. All right. I didn't want to say her name. Touch my sister and her hips and her back, and I yes, just declare hips and right back. now, in the name of Jesus, the great surgeon, the great physician will give you the hip replacement, the knee replacement. Not by the hand of a man, but by the hand of the great physician. I don't know these people, but God knows them. And he's doing a work. He's performing surgery and healing their body. How many is glad to know Christ the healer? Yeah, she's got real problems, hip, knee, all that, for many, many years. And we all know her well. They've been here 20 years. That's why we're... So hip and knee problems, kind that's, of, that's right. Polio, she said. So, Lord, I, I, I have a cousin uh, that also suffered polio back, I think, in the late 50s, early 60s. His name was um, John. And so, Lord, I just know what that can do in someone's life. And I thank you for just the supernatural touch of God in the joints, the ligaments, the tendons Wait, for both of them. Yeah, just... From this night forward, let her be able to sleep. Lord, this business of tossing and turning, not being able to stay asleep for extended periods of time, I just break that off of her right now in the name of Jesus. And wait, may wait, 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 you wait, wait. give your beloved sleep. Just wait. Just let him finish. Just, give, just wait for a minute. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit joint pain. I don't know if it's arthritis or what it might be, but I just break that right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm declaring this is for them, but it's also for people in this room. I break any genetic or historical connections in your families to cancer. It shall not be the thing which takes them out neither anyone else who is claiming this victory with me right now Christ the healer is in the room wait, wait, by wait, wait, his wait, wait, stripes wait, 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 you wait. are healed hallelujah hallelujah go ahead I don't want to just take the whole thing no no we're good we're not worried who takes the whole thing let's just wait on the Lord for a few minutes thank you Jesus aren't but you nobody minds if somebody takes the whole thing but let's aren't, just aren't you glad that the Lord is a healer for this See, did, did Donna, did you, did, did I hear correctly that you have diabetes? No, I thought I heard you say that. Not no, diabetes. No, she said polio, not diabetes. I heard the polio. Thank you. Just, just checking. How many people here have sugar diabetes? Go ahead and stand up real quick if you do. Steve, good to see you. I mean, I know it's distressingly common, but do me a favor, hold up your hand, if you would, if you're standing for prayer, so I can confirm that I've got the right people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Is that hand up or on your head? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Looking in the bleachers, 17. Am I missing somebody up there? 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, 27, 8, 9, 31. I had the number 32. Who's the 32nd person? I either missed you. Where? Oh, there. Okay, 32. That's the number I was looking for. Okay, we're going to pray for you and ask the Lord to balance your blood sugar. You ready? Just relax. Father, we ask now for the power of the Spirit to come over these, and we ask that you would raise the dead because diabetes is when the pancreas has died. And now the Spirit's falling on that woman over there in blue right now. Lord, we just ask for power to be released, the same power that raised Jesus up from the tomb and we speak to the spirit of death that has attached itself 
to the pancreases of these people and we command you to come off of them now in Jesus' name. Go! That's it. Go in Jesus' name. And we command the blood sugar now to drop, drop, drop and come into normal alignment in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're looking for 32 healings tonight. Now, give them a witness in their body. Let them yes. feel the virtue of the risen Jesus move through their physical frame that they would know you've touched them in this room tonight. Now, just wait. Just wait. That there's man in the... There's no hurry, no hurry. You're kind of in the center section in pink. You're our next indicator. The Lord hit her pretty hard. You're our next barometer right there. Just relax. Father, we ask you, open the heavens and let that power that raised Jesus from the dead come down upon them. And this man in blue, your blood sugar's been fluctuating of late. It's spiked and then dropped, and just when you think it's doing well, then it goes back, and it's caused you some secondary problems. We call them complications of diabetes. Now, Lord, we ask you down into the toes, neuropathy, Lord, we ask that you bring sensation back into the limbs in the name of Jesus. Let it come now in the name of Jesus. Are you Henry? Is Sir in Henry? blue, are you Henry? You're not Henry. Is there a Henry that's standing up, one of you? I don't know why I'm getting the name Henry, but maybe he's a straggler. <laughs> Except I was looking for 32 and we got 32, so. I'm gonna broaden it, because sometimes, sometimes I, I'm approximate. Is there a Henry with an endocrine condition? Henry with an endocrine condition. Doesn't need to be diabetes, Henry. Someone's pointing. I'm looking. I could be missing. <clears throat> hmm. Well, I'll pass it back to you, Chris. All right. So I, I'm seeing the number. I think it's like 6007. Does that mean anything to anybody? 6007. Six zero zero Wave seven. if that means something to you. By the way, you have no idea how many times somebody has come up to me after service and said, that was me. I think well, that's... Well, let's just hang on for a minute because some, sometimes, I've seen this over the years, it doesn't connect. They go, ah, wait. Just wait for a second. What's the number again? Like 6007. Where? Go ahead. What's that mean to you? It's the end of her bank account number. All right. <clears throat> What's the first couple numbers? No, oh, never mind. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I mean, does that, does that seem like something that you're... Not really? Really? Yeah, because you have a need, and the Lord is the supplier, the Jehovah Jireh. And even though there's been a difficulty at paying specific payments, I feel like, and I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, don't misunderstand me, but he is, we, we, are, we are the children of Abraham. And Abraham was told to look, claim, claim that. And even though we're not really naming it and claiming it, there's a specific bill that the Lord said that he's going to take care for you so that it does not have to be a continuing strain on you or re-injuring or hurting credit. And so Lord, I just declare in the name of Jesus for that provision for my sister who has been praying for financial provision, for you to split a Red Sea, for you to be a way maker. And I, Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name for that anointing to be upon her of provision. And Lord, that when this comes through, that she's going to be able to pray 
for people who have specific financial needs and he's gonna supply in that bank account within the next 30 days the provision for that need and situation. Do you believe that? Do you know that the Lord is gonna do that? Amen, let's praise the Lord together for that. So I'm also seeing quickly, um, I don't know if there's a family here. You've been, uh, the, the husband and wife have been together, I believe it's like 38 years. Right 38 there. years. <laughs> Wait, anybody, 38 years, just go ahead and stand up yeah, quickly. Yeah. That's okay. You're, you're, that's okay. There's a handful. There's a few. Yeah. You know, I just, 38 years, the number 38 in the scripture, wasn't it the, um, the lame man? Yeah, 38 years, right. Bethesda? And what, what about in Acts 3, the man laid at the gate? I'm, I'm having a brain lapse here. I don't know if 38's in that story or not, but I know the man that laid at the pool. So Lord, I'm declaring right now, the number 38, every paralyzed marriage that is not, a, and I'm not saying that's true for the one standing, I'm praying this in part. I'm praying for every marriage tonight that is weakened, that is paralyzed, that they will not sit by the pool but that there will be a life of enrichment like they've never experienced before in the name of Jesus. And I, I, it's not Blackman, but Jackman or something. Does that anybody strike you? Wait, say it again. Not Blackman, but he talks in riddles all the time. Yeah, not Blackman. I mean, but that's Jackman. just how his way is. It is Jackman, is the name you're talking about, right? Okay. How old are you, ma'am? Is, is, is your family here? Okay, stay right there. Is the family that I couldn't hear what the, is that per family here tonight or no? They're watching. So online. somebody with an, in the family, it's like um, Ryan, something Ryan, um, and then there's like a a Chris maybe. Christopher Ryan is somewhere. Who are, stand up real quick and wait. Christopher okay. Ryan. That's Christopher Ryan. Jackman's son is named Chris. So we got a Chris Jackman oh, and a Chris Ryan. Lord, what are you trying to do here? And we got 38. And, and mention what the pool means. You said don't be by the yeah, you know, that's just an important concept. sitting beside the pool, the life passing by crippled, paralyzed. Because without... that's the crippled guy with Bethesda for 38 years, sat by the pool, and he didn't get free. That's how the Lord came. So I just pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, that you will heal every hurt for this young man right there, that he will not be stalled in his purposes, that you will provide for him everything that he needs. And I declare in the name of Jesus from this moment forward, he will be a Christopher, a cross bearer, and will carry the life of Christ and he'll live up to that name. And even though there've been difficulties, even as a young man, I just break any form of rejection or feeling as though he's not good enough or self-esteem issues. I just break that off of you and may the joy of the Lord be your strength and you be filled with a new level of the joy of the Lord. And I pray for this 38 year old uh, marriage. Lord, here, whoever this bring is. It, bring it up here. We got her on the phone. We're on the phone and now just, just stay here. Let's, let, wait, let's put it on. Hey, her turn come up down. here. And, yeah. <laughs> Make it work. Good to see you, man. He's been one of our leaders here for many years. He just flew in for the, for the meeting. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's, what's the name uh, Ryan? I keep... Let's put it on speaker. 
say it again, Becky? No, I was just saying, is okay. there another Jackson there? Or is it no, I, I, I saw the name Ryan. Christopher Ryan is our son. Okay. So we got a Christopher Ryan Jackman and a Christopher Ryan. Yeah. So we got a couple of them going on. And they've been married 38 been married years. 38 I think years. that's the one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm sensing it. <laughs> Pardon me? He's 38? So, Lord, all when that you were 30, When you were 38? Yeah. Right, but at 38 years old, at a church, pool of Bethesda, church. face rejection, I just heal every church hurt and rejection for Christopher Ryan. Well, let's what, go on bizarre. both. We got a couple Christopher Ryans going here. And so let's just stay with us for a minute. Yeah. It, it, so Lord, pool I Bethesda just pray was his church, for family yeah. revival right now in the name of Jesus for this family. I declare, how many children do you have? Bruce and Becky, how many children do you have? Two. Two? Two. Two. All right. What was the other name I had? No, I, I said it just, oh, Christopher Ryan, that's right. Their son's name is Ryan. Yeah. Jack, man. Natalie or something. <laughs> What, what what is that? He said Natalie. I saw the name Natalie. I and what's know. Natalie? That's her daughter. That's your daughter. Good deal. Chris and Natalie. Chris and Natalie Jackman. I'm sensing it's really the one right here. Yeah. Just stay with this one. But you know the Lord has a way of like narrating these, threading these. Um, it's really hard to hear. So sorry if we're not answering. No, that's okay. So, Lord, I thank you for this couple and the ups and the downs that they have experienced and the difficulties they've survived and that their yes. marriage is to be a witness and a testimony yes. that you do yes. not have to lay beside a pool and die paralyzed in your marriage. But I thank you, Lord, that this couple and yes. their children will be a testimony yes. to the strength of marriage in this hour when it's yes. under assault yes. like never before. Lord, I'm yes. just praying for Chris and I'm praying for Natalie and I'm yes. praying God for you. Matches made in heaven. Lord, yes. for unity, healing, restoration, forgiveness, and just yes. a total makeover in their whole lives in every way, but particularly in yes. relationships. And so, Lord, for, for this moment forward, the number 38, meaning paralyzed, I break every stronghold, every crippled, paralyzed marriage. And I just declare peace and victory and enrichment over this family. And I pray for, is it Bruce? Is that what you said? Lord, that you'll just touch him and bring healing to him as well and Lord just touch him in his neck his back and shoulders Lord we just declare he will not have to suffer with arthritis pain but specifically L4 and L5 and Lord just the posture in his back I just pray right now that he'll have the backbone of steel and right now in his back in the name of Jesus that you will touch him and heal him and remove this pain and this affliction on him. And Lord, I also, I, there's someone, I don't know if it's you, ma'am, but, but with a hormonal imbalance, and I just speak yes. right now. Pardon me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Man, I'm in the flow now. I just I feel like I could climb a wall or something. I don't know. So Lord, I just thank you for touching that and bringing balance, Lord, in her body, the hormonal balance in the name of Jesus and the healing of the back, the balancing of the chemistry in her blood. Lord, as well, in Jesus' name, we just declare these bouts of, of, of tiredness to be broken off of her. Lord, in the name of Jesus, that she will have strength and even at two and three in the afternoon, she'll not be tired, but she'll have strength to finish the day and finish it strong. And we just break that tiredness in the name of Jesus. 
I declare by his stripes, ma'am, you are healed and so is your husband. And I'm just declaring a blessing, the blessing of Abraham over your family and the marriages in it. Praise him. Wait a second, wait a second. I, I, I would like her to tell us, tell us how you're responding, any of the things he said. Anything, anything that I'm touched you. I'm burning up. I'm burning up. My face is burning up. My body is burning up. You, you mean like I, the spirit touching you burning up or something yes. else? Okay. Yes, the spirit of God is touching me. My face is burning. My body is burning. I'm responding to what you're saying. It is true. I had a surgery several years ago related to the hormone imbalance. And... Um, and I've had problems since with a very, very slow metabolism from it. So the exhaustion is real. And how about your husband and the back? Was how, Did that register to you? Yeah, I've been having some issues the last couple of weeks with my lower back, and it's just been uh, just giving me fits. And so uh, it's, uh, it, I really feel it's feeling much, 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 much better. And the- he had, he had um, pneumonia this winter. And since then, he's had problems with his back. And so the relate the word about your children relationship does that connect to you? Well, those are our children, for sure. And I'm not exactly sure, but our our we our marriage started very difficult. We were a hot mess. My daughter was I was pregnant with my daughter before I got married, and so I. I believe it. And the Lord spoke to me in 1983 and said that I would marry Bruce. So I believe it. It is, it's, this is us and we receive this word. Well, Lord, I'm going to ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit to increase more yes. and more. Lord, touch them more. And you can thank Lewis for calling you up and bringing this phone call up here. Okay, okay now you can thank the Lord after. See, that that is sovereign. That's not guesswork. The Lord knows what he's doing. And he wants all of us to be vessels that he can speak through. And it's not just about a one man gifted one person, but body ministry is going to increase in a supernatural way in this period of time. I'm declaring it this weekend. There's going to be a new release of body ministry in Kansas City. I, I want to say about the uh, word you gave about the financial uh, breakthrough in 30 days. If something happens, come and tell us, okay? Just let us know if that, go ahead. Uh, I mean, in the next 30 days. Because I, I like to check words out and, and check in on them instead of, you know, you know, you know. Hallelujah. So I don't know why I keep seeing a picture of someone having a flat tire. It's like someone, I believe it's over here, right? Now, what's that mean? So I, I don't know you at all, but did you like something happen? Um, can I have a little more monitor? I must be deaf or something. Lord, pray for me, somebody. So did you, a flat tire, was it, is that, is that, is, are you the one on the way here? Yesterday, he had a flat tire yesterday. I feel like that the enemy... Go ahead. Okay. So, so Lord, I just pray right now. Did you, ch- you change it? You changed it. He changed you the flat changed tire before it right came before. Here. I knew something was like right before you came here, but you, I, I didn't know that, but the Lord knew it. And, and I feel like that there's something... I'm just waiting on the Lord. It was just like that there was someone that could have helped you but didn't or something. I, I, I can't quite catch exactly what that means, but the Lord knows. And so God here tonight, he came to church and changed this flat tire. Let's just wait. There's no, we're not in a hurry. And I feel like that there are people in this room, and particularly you, my friend, that the enemy would like to stifle you in your journey. 
from, you know, from progressing, from moving forward, getting to your destination. And I just declare right now in the name of Jesus, Which tire was it? Okay, back right. That's what I said. Something back. I, I and and why would that matter? I I don't to build faith. To build faith. I I didn't guess that. I had a flat tire recently, and it was my front. But I said something back. I knew it was like was it back right? Okay, back right. So Lord, I just declare right now for a supernatural help on his journey. And I'm trying to tune into what the Spirit's trying to say about this, but I know I saw it for a reason. So Lord, every single person in this room that is struggling in their journey, on their journey, that they're, they're facing difficulty, I just pray right now that there will be a grace released to bring things back into balance. And anything that's been flattened or anything that has lost air, the enemy would love to just pop the air right out of your faith, out of your praise, out of your joy. But I feel like that the Lord allowed that to happen as a sign and a wonder. That he, he and you know what I think something else, I think the Lord likes to share things like that to show us he sees the little things that seem insignificant. And, and the message is that the Lord's going to help him in his life. There's some kind to get of get going in a new way, get going in a new way, at a new speed, a new level. And there's going to be an acceleration, new relationships, new connections. Is there like a new kind of relationship? Okay. I guess, I guess so. Just make sure she's not your spare. Ooh. No, I'm I'm being lighthearted, okay? Okay, you can stand back up. So I just okay. feel like that if you can just tune in and discern what God is trying to do in your life. I don't know. <laughs> the Lord knows you and everything about you, and he wants to knit your hearts in his will. And if you'll seek him above seeking each other, then his purposes can be fulfilled in your life. And so I just declare this acceleration. Wait, 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 wait. And progress and moving forward in their journey. And Lord, if they're supposed to be, let it be. But Lord, whatever, help my brother from this night forward to not experience a roadside issue in life, but that he will move forward and progress in the things of God, in the highway of holiness, Isaiah 35. You can think that sounds crazy, but the Bible talks about highway. And I think we're all on a journey. And you're just at a specific point where God's releasing fresh grace to you and to you from this moment forward. Let's praise so the Lord for saying, that. I'm going to help you through those things. You're saying, Lord, and he says, I hear you. I'm with you. Have you been seeking him about this situation, talking to him? I feel like the whole coming together was sort of a unique story. It wasn't just a mutual friends kind of thing, but it was like, is that right? It was like some kind of unique situation that even brought this together. Um, and it's out of the ordinary. What does, does that make sense to you? If it does lift up your hand, if yeah, that's right. Sense. So it, it, that's true. You know, I love this. The, this is what happens, by the way, this is just a quick teaching moment. When you are under the unction of prophecy or words of knowledge that leads to prophet, prophecy or to healing, the longer you talk, the more you connect with their spirit. Just like when Jesus sat down with the woman at the well and he began to have a conversation with her after they talked about water and how they're going to draw water and then he tuned into her spirit and discerned her circumstances. He said, go call your husband. She said, I have no husband. He said, you've said, well, you've had five. The one you're with now is not your husband. So it's like the longer that you talk. So 
Thank you, Lord, for that unique coming together. And I just pray right now for people in this room. There, there are people in this room, you are praying for a significant other. And everyone that's supposed to have a significant other, I pray that there would be such sovereignty and such bliss that what God puts together, let no man doubt or put asunder. And I, I'm not predicting these two to get married and I'm not saying they won't. I wanna make that clear. But I am saying that your life is defined. It's like I hear you guys even talking about that. Something about, it, it, you know, we want what God wants, but it's not about uh, this conversation like in the car or something. But thank you, Lord, for this uniqueness, this unique couple with their unique gifts. And I'm just praying your sovereign hand upon their life and thank you for helping on them on their way and their journey. Let's praise the Lord one more time. Okay. Yes, we, we got a little testimony here. I think this is um, the very first child that you were talking about. There's a couple, they're biracial marriage. They've been in the hospital they're still in the hospital right now. Their daughter's name is Tikva, and she's been suffering with pulmonary vein stenosis. So they think that was the word you were referring to, the strange yeah, so disease, Lord, the one you started with. Touch Tikva in the name of Jesus, and just supernaturally let the angel of the Lord go into that very room. Let's all agree that it's a very important uh, little yes. one-year-old together. Imagine Tikva. it being your child. Tikva. Let's, can we stand up? Everybody join me and stand up. Tikva, yeah. We just declare healing for Tikva. She's one years old, yes. Pulmonary vein stenosis. In Jesus' name, Lord, we Jesus ask you. Jesus' name. Lord, we ask you to you extend your, your hand power. for healing. Right now, we stand with Ari and, his, and their daughter right now that the power of the Holy Spirit would touch this little one in the hospital in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So I just want to speak encouragement to the father, Ari. Is, are you on there? I am, yes. So I want you to expect a change in this situation. That starting tonight, we're declaring the angel of the Lord to visit this child in that room. And that it will be a testimony to the greatness of our God and his mighty power. In the name of Jesus Christ, we release it into your hands, Lord, to bring it to pass. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Ari. Well, we're going to end with that. You, you got anything? You want to want a couple more moments? You got something? You, he's saying he doesn't know how adventuresome he feels right now. Let me go back to this couple over here real quick that Chris was just speaking to. You know, this whole thing of the tire, I think it's kind of a wordplay. It's prophetic wordplay. Um, so this could almost sound cheesy, but I'm just going to say, I think somehow you lost your drive. And so things were slowing down, as with a car with a flat tire, and things were out of balance. You, you need, you know, all the tires to be filled. So things have been out of balance, and I think the Lord is encouraging you to uh, find, a, find a new place with the Holy Spirit because this thing I think this is word and spirit actually you know these two come into balance and this is really where we want to be and somehow spirit was maybe out of balance in your world I think the Lord wants to rebalance that so that your your path is smoother does that make sense you've been kind of on a rough ride as it were let's say it's a little bit of a word play but yeah does that fit so I, I really would encourage you to, to seek after the things of the Spirit for this. Um, because I believe God will give you a much better ride going forward. All right. The other thing I wanted to ask is, was there, I see a woman holding a baby back there, but I don't know if it's her, and I see people leaving, so we may be a bit late to the party, but is there or was there a baby back in that zone near the exit who had a problem with the neck? such the, the neck was I don't know somehow crooked or something what didn't quite straighten correctly is that your baby you don't I don't even know if you know I'm not you is that are you shaking your head she's saying no okay 
So, like I said, I I don't know. People could have left. I'll, I'll yeah, just leave okay. it at that. We'll stop. Okay, so we're going to say thank you, Lord. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for these two weekends in July. We ask you to unfold this divine poetic purpose that you've been initiating. And we say it's your leadership. We want what you want, but we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So tomorrow night, 6 o'clock right here, if you want a book signing, Bonhoeffer book, Eric is going to be right back there. And so get a book and he'll sign and Dean's going to be with you, Eric, just, just to be a help. So see you tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. Come a few minutes early to come get a seat. Yeah. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, just go ahead and just as we're going out, if you don't mind.